So my name is Ayanda Tuku. I am the National Youth Coordinator of the Young African Entrepreneurs Institute. Um, I think the whole expo is just like exposing young people to opportunities um, and get them like a corporate experience, but at the same time giving them ideas and allowing them to engage with each other to build their businesses and share ideas in order to build um, you know, a better economy for South Africa. My name is Ayanda Gwanya. I come from Natural Love. Uh, Natural Love, we manufacture uh, our own hair care brand. Um, why am I here? Uh, to learn more. You know, as an entrepreneur, I only started last year. So having problems with funding and also how you market yourself to people as you knew. Uh, my background is chemistry, so you, you don't have this background about businesses and all about it. So coming to this um, uh, expo, it's for me to learn how do I market myself. Today has been a really good experience, but a very stressful one. Um, we have master classes, we're currently running a hackathon right now where people are presenting ideas and coming with people in the tech space to bring and put those ideas and bring them to life. Yes, my name is Gossi Mpuhu from ProSkin Cosmetics. Um, well, I am enjoying the expo. Like, um, I think it's a very good opportunity to learn about business. And I'd like to thank the Young African Entrepreneur Institute for just organizing everything and making everything available for entrepreneurs to grow. We know that youth um, unemployment is a very um, big struggle. And here's the other person who goes around carrying a toothbrush and a toothpaste. Mouthwash in African homes is regarded as a luxury. But is it supposed to be a luxury or it is a health need? Fresh mo is a mouthwash packaged in a sachet to give you convenience. When you're shopping, when you are at work, when you head to your lunch, you need something to refresh your mouth. Instead of <laughs> imagine. Fresh mo is a South African uh, mouthwash. This is our formula. Uh, we created our own formula and uh, Freshmo has been tested by the University of Limpopo um, because SAPS doesn't have a testing standard for mouthwash. So they had to test it through the University of Limpopo. The shelf life for Freshmo is two years and it's alcohol free. Because I know if I done the one for alcohol, with alcohol, they're going to ask me for 70% alcohol. <laughs> How many flavors are there in Freshmo? We've got five flavors. This one is the peppermint. We've got spearmint. We've got apple blush. We've got strawberry. And my favorite is watermelon. It's easy to carry around because it's in a such a... I don't carry a wallet. You can easily put it in your pocket, in your handbag, in your wallet. It's easy to carry around and it's affordable. 3 rand 75 per, per sachet. Who are our potential clients and customers? SPA, um, SPA, North Rand uh, Distribution Center are on board. Uh, we are finalizing the paperwork. They've already ordered the first batch of 3,000 sachets. ShopRite has already taken our documents and the decision is pending. This came, uh, samples, documents submitted, and the decision is pending. Sasol, uh, samples and documents are to be submitted, and the decision is pending. What are the challenges? The challenges that we are facing as fresh more brands is access to market and funding for, um, to service the potential orders. Example is um, the 3,000 such as that have been ordered by by SPA, so I need to get raw materials for, for the, that order. I also need to do boxes because we are going to package fresh more into a box of 30 sachets. And then the, obviously, mouthwash is an industry that is dominated by companies from outside Africa. And uh, they've got big budgets. 
We don't have any budget for marketing and advertising. Uh, so we also need to create brand awareness. There's an opportunity for um, uh, the, the, the mouthwash, the fresh more, because according to the um, Houghton Economic Department, they estimate that the Spaza Township net, um, economy is worth around 100 billion, even if there is a debate with the World Bank if that um, uh, figure is accurate. But let's assume it's just 10% of that amount. We want to tap into that Spaza network to distribute fresh more because in our African communities, mouthwash is regarded as a luxury. That is why it is only available in a few you know, uh, retail shops and stuff. We want to decentralize that and make it available to our township because it's easy to walk into your Spaza shop and get your fresh more. So far, we have received um, support from Bitfest, who are providing the, the packaging and printing of uh, the sachet, and Kemin is providing the, the lab facilities. Uh, in between me and my son, who is our head of production, we've got more than 15 years' experience in cosmetic and customer relationship management. Um, that's the, 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 our rec recruitment in, uh, needs and plans that we, 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 we have. Um, yeah, we can connect, but uh, before I finish, we're looking for uh, probably 480,000 just to help us with um, uh, to purchase the raw materials and to do the, the, the boxes that we, we, we need. But I'm going to close with this. Um, let me close with this. I'm not so sure how to play it. I'm not so sure if it's loud enough. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Paul Masilo. some innovation right there. I know very well, right after you eat a meal during the course of the day, you just feel like um, I think this is great. I mean, I would definitely use it. Show of hands, how many of us would be interested in trying it out, right? And here you have a full market base. Um, question that I have now, if you can just pop up back. I'm asking these questions, Pat. You never know who's sitting in the room. Question, is it patented? Yes. Uh, Fantastic. Yes, Chef Life, Alcohol Free. Yeah, it's a proudly South African. And it has actually been endorsed by Proudly South African, that organization that promotes um, South African brands. Yes. Then, this is the logo for Proudly South African. So, yeah, for Proudly. The middle of our office is um, looks like that we buy sometimes from our outside partners. Absolutely. So, we are the source to come up with our own formula. Oh, yeah. I'm always excited when I meet innovative entrepreneurs who are patenting their product and ready to distribute them to the world. Because I believe that the growth of the economy also relies on our export strength, right? And the more we can build proudly South African, patent our products, and license, license them globally, the more we'll see our economy grow. So I think it's absolutely exciting um, what you've created. And thank you very much for sharing that with us. So now we go to our third business which is Kasi Convocation. Kasi Convocation. Please give him a round of applause. Uh, guys. Did you know stock fails plays a key role in improving people's lives in townships? Hi everyone, my name is Chuanki. 
founder and managing director of Kasi Convocation. Kasi Convocation means people having a gathering in a region or place. That's for me a community of Stockfeld members with the vision of bringing township people, businesses, SMEs, etc., into a space where they can relate on local issues and help rebuild township economy. My late mom was a huge contributor of Stockfelds, and I saw how Stockfelds could be doing so much more and be used to help communities in a much bigger and vital way. Unfortunately, my mom passed on before getting most out of Stockfelds. If my mom had access to marketplace of Stockfelds, exposure to information and resources, she would have better chances of profiting from Stockfelds. Our solution to these problems is a Stockfeld community and marketplace platform, which is super easy to use. After signing up, members get pulled into a Stockfeld ecosystem, connect with like-minded peers, and gain hugless access and transparency to marketplace of Stockfeld with supportive community that encourages peer support. Stockfelds are a forever growing market. As long as population grows, so is our opportunity. In fact, Township culture and economy is directly linked to Stockfelds as they drive a financial astute society and has been the best thing next to churches in terms of individual's identity and brand. Stockfelds have been generating more than 45 billion rand each year for the past five years, and now they're on the verge of breaking through 60 billion rand market value. Just last year, Stockfelds sent in 50 billion rand with a combined membership of 12, over 12 million people. Banks and retail stores know this is the market we should be invested in. In the bid of generating revenue for a business, we have five methods in place which they explained as follows. We have a wallet system. Let's envision with 50 billion rand of last year with a combined member set of 12, of 12 million people. Our aim is to capture 2% of the market which will give us a market share of 1 billion rand of transactions with a member set of 240,000 people depositing their money on the platform and will be charging admin fees of 2%, which will give us a market share of 20 million rand a year. Freemium model. Members' access to the platform will be free in exchange of their own data, which will be used for a market research purposes to improve our service delivery, as well as sharing the data with third parties for a fee. Traffic attribution commissions means we'll get a commission out of all products and services rendered through our marketplace. Advertising, individuals, brands, SMEs, etc., looking to scale operations within township mass market will now be able to target all sorts of stock fairs, memberships, offerings, etc., through advertisement for a fee. Enterprise licensing, organizations, brands, businesses, etc., will now be able to use our platform's APIs on their own website as their own internal data for a fee. Kasi Convocation is an expanding online directory of stock fairs. What we do is we organize the stock fairs data by regions, then makes it universal, accessible, and strategically useful for easy accessibility of an extensive sorted database of stock fairs for all parties involved and interested in stock fair activities. Guys, there is no single platform where anyone can just sign up, learn about stock fairs, browse their content to extent of engagement, and having deep conversations with them up until now, which means we have a first mover advantage and the data set of 200 people waiting for our beta fees. We have been incubated by the Incubate Academy, Innovation Bridge Portal, undergoing the incubation program of the Innovation Hub, What One Foundation, and Creative Industries, which they currently assisting us with compliance and legislation issues. And we got recognized by three national radio stations. Uh, after high school, I wanted to study computer science. However, my family couldn't afford to send me to Vasit. So as a substitute to formal education, I self-taught myself programming through YouTube and other learning materials. I have an in-house development prototype progress, uh, which, I've managed, which, which, is up, which is complete up to 60% of work. I am here asking for a sponsorship consisting of four programmers, five laptops, and the hosting service to work on releasing our first phase of pilot phase. We're actually raising a total funding of 3.5 million rand. However, a million rand will be able to get us through our first phase. We are going to revolutionize the industry from scratch, only better. Come join us in building the foundation for a resilient economy and society. Come join us in empowering communities 
through stock fairs. Thank you. Yes, uh, actually right now we actually outsourcing is a company which is already assisting us with, with, with the development. So we're actually going to be launching uh, some, somewhere around August. Mm -hmm. Yes, so with the help of the innovation hub, of course, the incubation yeah. program which I'm part of. Okay, and once you guys launch, where are you going to test it? Uh, so uh, I've been conducting surveys and interviews and I have around 200 people waiting for our services. So as soon as we get the product, you already, we just need to send emails and WhatsApp texts. I have most of the people on my phone, so I just need to send them a text and say, hey guys, there's, there's the platform which I've been telling you guys, can you guys test it and let me know the feedback. That's when we're going to use the feedback to iterate up until we reach the MVP phase. Mm -hmm. Then we, once we reach the MVP phase, that's when we're going to be able to target all the market oh, of nice. stock fairs. Oh, wow. Yes. Let's give a round of applause. <laughs> you know, the future lies in the hands of young people, right? And we preach it, we sing it, we are taught that from a young age, but now we see it in action because young people are taking up the reins and actually taking accountability for the state of their own lives and for the state of the lives of their communities. So very exciting product. I think yeah. I'll look out for the launch as well. <laughs> yeah, I will speech. send you a survey. All right. Super, yeah. super. Thank yeah. you very much. Thanks for having me, guys. <laughs> My only one question and call is where are the ladies? Hmm? Where are the ladies? I don't understand. Where are the ladies in this group? I don't know. <laughs> um, you know, um, in my experience, um, I do a lot of youth development, a lot of business development, and one question that funders always have is where are the women who own businesses? We are struggling to find them, right? And when we look at how many SMEs um, exist in the country and how many are male owned, how many are female owned, and how many um, SMEs that have been funded are actually male owned, the statistics are a bit shocking, right? Um, we need to now focus as a society of involving confidence in young girls from a young age. Um, we do know that, you know, with Wama Hai, some of us, you know, we come from rural areas, and the structures there are that women or girls need to stop being domesticated before everybody else. You know, when I knew I was a feminist, it was the day we were kids, and I was 10, and my cousin was 12, and he was a boy, and there were two incidents. The first one was, he was taught how to drive at a very young age. My expectation was that when I get to his age, I'm going to learn to drive too. And I was told, no, you have to wait. I said, why? He was taught at a young age. When will I be taught? That was the first one. The second one, now as kids, you know, you play together, you do all sorts of activities, you get dirty, you play outside forever. And when we came back into the house, what I noticed as well, he didn't have to do the dishes. And he was clean with me. We were eating together. The mess we made, we made together. Why does he not have to wash the dishes? And that's when I realized, for me, as a young child, that you know, no, 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 I'm going to set up my own structure and I'm going to take charge of my life. But it's a big problem in society still today where girls are not taught how to take charge. Girls are not given the confidence to lead economies, to lead industries. Girls are not given the confidence to invent or innovate, right? So even within ourselves now, our little sisters, our little cousins, our nieces, we need to be the people that set the example for them because they are looking at us and what we do sets a standard you know, to move throughout. So I do look forward to seeing more female-owned businesses innovating, creating, patenting, licensing, distributing, making lots and lots of money. So yeah, so that's on that point. Um, moving forward, our program is a bit different now. Um, we are waiting for one of our speakers, so if you guys could just bear with us um, while I check the progress we have. While we're here, think of ideas, guys. Think of the next big thing that you're going to create. Think of how we solve all of our electricity issues, our water issues, sanitation issues. 
there's a big opportunity in the problem that we have in the country. These opportunities are there for us to solve, right? Yeah. I can't hear you. Yeah. Correct? Yeah. Are the problem solvers in this room? Yeah. Ah. Why don't I look confident? So, where's the confidence, guys? We need to be confident in ourselves and our capabilities to solve these problems. There's nobody to come in to save us. It's honestly us right now. Okay. So, I'd like us to continue with our program. I'd like you to introduce you guys to our keynote speaker for the day. And this is a woman I completely am inspired by. Um, she's a force and she's completely an amazing leader. So this is Honorable Nomandu Gomorali Bubu, who is the MEC for Gauteng Finance and E-Government. The political career of Ms. Nomandu Gomorali Bubu started in the late 80s when she worked for South African Railway and Har Harbour Workers Union. She started working as the Administrative Secretary and later became the Education Officer. She learned the theory of working class and molded her future political career. She was a Political Education Officer an assistant secretary in the African National Congress for Women's League, a leader. Her commitment to the struggle made her rise to the movement to be selected as the League's deputy president in Gauteng in 2011, and also an executive member of the Progressive Women's Movement. In 1994, at the dawn of democracy, she was the chief administrator and personal assistant to two deputy directors who were part of voter education department in the Independent Electoral Commission. She later became the personal assistant for the managing director of Mali Bongo, which is a wing of the ANC. In the following year, Gomorrah um, was given the responsibility to become a senior administrator for the Gauteng Provincial Legislature, and she worked for the Department of Housing as a personal assistant to the MEC of Housing. Her political training in countries like the Soviet Union motivated uh, the ANC to deploy her as a member of the provincial legislature. This is in 1999. Subsequently, from 2001 to 2004, she was a whip and a caucus treasurer for the party from 2004 to 2008. She was appointed as the chairperson of the Agriculture and Rural Development, Conservation and Environment Committee in the Gauteng Provincial Legislature. This is a very extensive career and apart from the above mentioned, she has also achieved the following. A Diploma in International Relations and Labor Relations Issues at the Academy of Labor and Social Relations in Moscow. Postgraduate Diploma in Financial Economics and Economic Principles in the University of London. A Diploma in Public Policy and Development in the University of Witwatersrand. Right here. Diploma in Public Management from Regenesis, uh, Business Studies and Sport Management Diploma from Boston City Campus as well as the Sheila Weinberg Award in Gauteng 2005 and 2006 as the best performing parliamentary constituency office in the province. And that is an achievement. Can we please give her a round of applause as she joins us on stage. Let me greet the program director, invited panelists and guests, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. Let me first start by thanking the organizers of this event for inviting us to participate in this expo program to share information about the work of our departments as well as the services that we offer. Program director, the youth of this country continues to play an important role in society and as government we have a responsibility to develop programs that are aimed at empowering young people so that they can become self-sufficient. The current unemployment stats indicates that more than 40% of youth are unemployed and the economy is also not responding well as well as for recovering of COVID-19. It's still a concern that we all have. 
I was still wearing my mask and I was surprised that not everyone is wearing it. By the way, the minister has just announced it. By the way that we are used to the mask, you even forget now that we can do away with it. So, Program Director, the first goal is to revive youth so that they can reclaim their rightful position in society and encourage them to be part of the transition to eradicate socio-economic transformation. This infusion into yourselves as young people must be done with a singular focus of giving new meaning to programs, strategies and implementation of government programs which relate to the empowerment of young people. It is time-tested and evidenced the reality that once stagnation and indecision creeps in within the society, it has always been the youth who, who come to rescue of the country, like the 1976 generation which gave yet another impetus into the country. The youth of the past generation never failed to galvanize and harmonize the power to change the character and the face of the struggle for repolition and to become the primary catalyst of activism and political change. This country, especially this province in Gauteng, needs young people, especially young leaders who display youthful political exuberance, much like the giants who transversed this part before them. But the struggle today is much more different than what happened 40 odd years ago. Today's struggle should be about education, it should be about empowerment of young people. Of course, as government, we have done our part, but not enough. And yes, we still need to do more to ensure the economic emancipation of young people in our country. And I must also ascend that, I, that programs that are, that are done by government, especially that are meant to, to empower young people, we must interact with them, but make sure that we bring in other stakeholders who are key in assisting us in these programs as government that we are doing, in, including communicating those programs so that everyone is aware of what government is doing. And I think today this partnership that we have done to ourselves, it's one step to the right direction of ensuring that you are aware of things that we are doing. As I indicated earlier on, the unemployment rate, particularly among young people, is unacceptably high. Poverty and inequality have deepened in our society. When I delivered Houghton Provincial Budget for 2020-2023, the legislature in March, I announced that we will spend $36 billion over the next three years to improve infrastructure service delivery projects, create more, much more needed jobs and development in our communities. And this includes the bulk infrastructure development that promotes local employment and transforms marginalized areas of the province. Tourism infrastructure development and upgrade is one of the critical areas that we should look into again as the province. Investment schemes that unlock private sector funded development, that's another area that we want to look into. In addition, these resources will be used to build and maintain public infrastructure that provides enabling environment that is required to deliver government services to communities, including schools, healthcare facilities, libraries, social development facilities, and sports facilities. And departments already, they've started to do that work in their programs that they've submitted in the cabinet. This massive infrastructure expenditure will provide many opportunities for township entrepreneurs in various sectors, including manufacturing, build environment, renewable energy, and other specific areas that government has indicated. And we took a decision that as we emerge from COVID-19, we must work within our Growing Houting Together plan, which is a plan that Premier Makura has unveiled in 2019. And that plan needs to, um, we must urgently implement it, and we must grow economy and create jobs for our people, especially young people. But we understand that government cannot do this alone. And therefore, we have, amongst other things, established a provincial war room on the economy, in which government work with the industry to drive economy recovery, unlock growth in every sector, and create sustainable jobs, as well as to support SMME development. We want to unleash both public and private resources through partnership to place our economy on a sustainable recovery and grow path for the benefit of the people of this province and indeed for our country. We will be partnering with our provincial bank, which is Standard Bank, to implement the priorities for the provincial government, including the areas of skills development, youth leadership and bursaries across the Gauteng province, programs that are targeted to empower small businesses within Gauteng region with a particular focus on the township informal economy, 
women will be part of those including youth enterprise and supplier development, empowerment, financing, socioeconomic development, consumer education, and access to financial services for SMMEs. So those are the things that now we'll be doing with yourselves. The resources, the skills, and expertise that Standard Bank is investing on as part of this partnership will go a long way in assisting us to drive a meaningful economic transformation in the province, including supporting entrepreneurs, cooperatives, particularly in our townships. Our view remains that our township must not only be the dormitories where people go to sleep and wake up the following day and go to work in the cities. And I think we want to ensure that part of the budget allocation now, more allocation goes to the townships with this assistance of young people that must be part of that development in those townships that we want to channel some of the funds that we are doing as government. Even in the budget council that is coming soon, we will definitely raise sharply this issue of ensuring that our focus now is in the townships and make sure that we revitalize them, we change the, lane, the face of our, our, our townships. This will in turn grow local economies and create local jobs for the people. On this note, as a province, again, we have made a significant progress towards achieving this objective. When we have introduced the Gauteng Economic Development Act, this was a giant step in our efforts to transform township economies by supporting local business to grow and create jobs. Through this act, as government, we will link township investment facilitation to value chain transformation and SMME empowerment through active enterprise development and supplier development. We are going to create an economic geography for the township enterprise zones which overlays and which is with a benefit staking, which means that to stake in these zones all the accessible benefits for the people and businesses such as funding, procurement, better bylaws, by tax breaks and dedicated programs. Why we are raising the issue of bylaws? It's because as provincial government, we want to work very closely with municipalities because sometimes you can see an opportunity in a township and there is a building that is unused, but that building belongs to municipalities. But now we will be having this partnership with them so that when you say, I want to do this business in this specific location, municipality is part of that program so that there is this integration of the work that we're doing as provincial government and municipalities in our province. We will definitely have incentive on the installation of broadband in the township enterprise zones. We want to ensure that we install connectivity in almost every area in the township and empower township-based internet service providers whilst in the process we are unleashing global business services sector, thereby contributing to much needed job opportunities, especially for the youth as well. We are going to introduce funding designed specifically for township-based enterprises. The interventions that we are introducing because of this act are aimed at promoting inclusive human settlement by bringing people closer to economic opportunities. And we want to develop a real commuter economy that user, users take it ranks and, con, and we convince, convert them rather into mini, bus, bus, mini bus business and commercial districts. We, are, we must integrate again unused land, abandoned buildings and unforgotten industrial estates into township value chains to table change, table change touch of economic growth of the GCR and the creation of new economic geography through township enterprise zones. One of the most existing initiatives that will, made, that will be made possible again as a result of the act is that allows government to designate certain areas within township as economic enterprise zones or township enter enterprise precinct. Businesses in these zones will be provided with different forms of support to ensure that they are, they, they are sustainable and they are able to grow. We strongly believe that this will encourage industrial and commercial activity into economically depressed areas to progressively reduce the prevalence of deprived populations in areas exhibiting township characteristics by allowing government support to be responsive, progressive and cumulative to targeted deprived populations. And it will also facilitate spatial transformation into a changing economic context across the province. We want to take youth and young people we, along with us and ensure that they are economically empowered 
And once they are empowered, they will be able to create jobs in their own respective communities. And hence, the economic opportunities are important for young people. They are household and their communities. And these include access to new or better opportunities, improved quality of work, and the enhanced of prospects of youth in finding jobs and creating their own businesses. Program director jobs are the most important determinant of living standards. And quantitative analysis confirms that change in labor earnings is the largest contributor to poverty reduction. More broadly, economic opportunities for youth can be viewed within the larger extent of poverty reduction efforts where economic gains translate into social and cultural and physical assets. Without these opportunities, the repercussions of youth can be significant in addition to negative economic outcomes, both unemployment and underemployment can undermine life satisfaction and results in an undesirable social and tragedies over the time. I'm sure you can see that this act is a game changer, not only while encouraging the private sector to, priv to, to privilege SMEs, particularly from the township in their procurement practices, but we are also ourselves have taken a decision to deliberately support local SMEs, especially those owned by previously disadvantaged individuals in our procurement. To access these opportunities, pl please make sure that your company or your cooperative is registered with companies and with the Companies and Intellectual Property Commission, which is commonly known as CIPC. Once you have done that, then register your company on Central Supplier Database, commonly supplied referred to as CSD, and this is national database for the government suppliers and is owned by National Treasury. And the Provincial Treasury do assist you to register on CSD for free because we know that other people do sell that registration if you want, they want to assist you. So as Houghton Provincial Government, we run CSD on behalf of National Treasury in this province. It is important that you register on CSD for you to access opportunities in government, and registration is free of charge. You don't have to pay any or to register on CSD. If you need assistance with CSD, please let us know that we can send our mobile team to assist you as a group of entrepreneurs everywhere in the province. Make sure that you have the following documents to be registered electronically on the e-suppliers registration platform, a certified ID copy, a CK number, original and valid tax clearance certificate, and proof of your bank account. Provincial Treasurer will also offer you to, to tend, how to tender, tender workshops. Before COVID-19, these workshops were conducted every Wednesday in our building at 75 Fox Street. But over the past day and a half, we've been doing them online to comply with COVID-19 restrictions. But I think again now, because the regulations uh, have been waived to certain issues, we will definitely go back to that system so that when you are around town, you can go to the Gauteng, to Gauteng Provincial Treasury, 75 Fox Street. We do have again a Gauteng Center of Excellence there. I call it a mini university that we have done with Microsoft. That mini university, we do trainings for SMMEs, for young people on ICT. Those are the issues that we do provide on the other side with the Department of E-Government that is part of our departments that we are running as a treasury and e-government. So we call them sister departments. So we, with the relaxation of COVID-19 restrictions, we will start conducting them again, and we can also bring these workshops into your area if you want us to come and do them as a group of entrepreneurs and you are willing to, ad and willing to attend. Just let us know. And during the workshops, entrepreneurs are given tips about the process of tender evaluation and how to fill our tender documents. The companies are categorized to ensure that we focus on these specific areas. Youth and female-owned companies have benefited a lot from these workshops. The sessions also provide a platform for business networking and we are free of charge, as I've indicated earlier on. SMMEs, particularly youth township entrepreneurs, are the future, and we must do everything necessary to support them including true progressive procurement practices that are transparent, efficient, and corruption-free. Market access is a key determinant for sustainability, and in this regard, it is important that companies committed to entrepreneurial development also ensure that emerging businesses they promote, that they promote are actively absorbed in their own supply chains. This second wave of empowerment will ensure that young black businesses in townships in particular 
and township enterprises, including SMMEs and cooperatives that are particularly empowering, become more sustainable by participating in other value chains within the economy, including the private sector. Ultimately, our goal is to ensure that these enterprises not only depend on government contracts, rather they are self-sustaining. As the Gauteng Provincial Government, we view the Township Economic Development Act as a key enabler to our bold Township Economy Revitalization Strategy, which is a plan we are currently implementing in partnership with the private sector, labor, and the rest of society. This is one of the most direct and effective routes towards addressing socioeconomic challenges that we are facing, particularly growing our economy and fighting the crisis of unemployment in our com communities. I, urge, I therefore urge you as young people to take advantage of the opportunities that the Township Economic Development Act brings to start or grow your business by providing goods and services to people in this area and beyond. By doing so, you will assist us to revitalize township economies, ensure that they develop into centers of production and commercial activity. Thank you, Program Director, for the opportunity, and thank you for this partnership that we have done. I've seen a number of people with the video that uh, uh, the team sent it to me, people that have been coming to the stands uh, that you have provided to us. We really appreciate, we don't take light this partnership. We will want to continue doing this, especially with yourselves as University of Vets. Thank you so much. So we know that partnership with government is a very important element in the progress and the success of any industry, um, any business sector in any country, right? And a lot of us, perhaps, you know, when we're younger, we're not aware of how important it is to be, you know, informed and understanding of what the government is doing in order to support certain industries, young people, as well as ourselves. Um, fun fact, Elon Musk, we all know Elon, right? And we all like him because he's doing some super cool stuff. Elon Musk is succeeding because he got support from his government, which is technically kind of not his government, he's South African. But he's succeeding the way he's succeeding because the government gave him an opportunity. And the opportunity that the government gave him um, was to, to do space, space exploration, right? And without having a government tender, to be very honest, he would not have the success he has today. So it's a fact that not many people know, but we do need to engage our government. And the door is open, as MEC has alluded. So we need to, as young people, open ourselves up and understand that the government is here to support us. So thank you very much, MEC. So now we're coming into an exciting panel discussion that I really look forward to. My job here is done. Um, so I'm going to introduce the facilitator, wonderful facilitator for this um, wonderful program. And the panel discussion basically is about positioning your business for success from both domestic and global perspective. As we have said, guys, we need to think globally, right? We need to think what? Absolutely. So I'd like to introduce the chief executive officer of Novalo, U Zanele Maduna, who's also a chartered accountant. Please clap hands for her. Right. I think this is, oh, that's cheeky then, okay. Hi, everybody. Um, as Kim has said, thank you, Kim, for that. I am Zanella Maduna. I am a chartered accountant by profession, and I am the CEO of Novalo Learning Center. With regards to what we do at Novalo, we pride ourselves in actually working with the youth so that they become more employable and enterprising. So that's why I'm happy to be part of this event. Because today we're looking at how can we make you guys more enterprising. And I'm more excited about our topic today because it's all about how do you position your brand for success locally as well as globally. So by the show of hands, who of you currently have businesses? Let's see. Okay, so many of you. Okay, so we can sell to each other, but then we also have to look into who else can we sell too as well, right? I am excited for today because I have amazing panelists 
to join me. We are going to find out from them how can we position our brands for success and how can we even squeeze all the sands that are already in South Africa, how can we actually take all of that and also take more globally? And why are we even talking about this? Why are we talking about um, the global market and even accessing it? This is mainly because of the fact that we are living in a global village, right? Now we're in a position whereby you can DM Mark Zuckerberg. I don't know if he'll respond, <laughs> but you can DM Mark Zuckerberg. You can DM Elon Musk. Um, but then at the same time, in as much as yes, you do have people, access to people from Europe, you have access to people from China. How can you position yourself? Is it a matter of just starting a Facebook page and then now those people can buy from you? What is an export? What is an import? What should happen? Can they even trust you? So those are the things that we'll explore today with our panelists. And they are skilled in their respective fields. I can't wait to learn from them. Before I call on my panelists, I just want to agree with you guys on one thing, right? Because when I'm sitting there and I'm asking them questions, I know I'll get to a point where I understand them, you know, like entrepreneur to entrepreneur, professional to a professional. But then I just want us to agree on how will I know that you also understand what we're talking about. Are you going to say, yebo, away, yay, yes? You know, let's, let's agree on something. I need ideas. I need ideas. Uh, someone, someone, okay. What, are you going gonna to do this? You guys, the clicking thing. So we're going into a poetry type of session because it's going to be wisdom and all, right? Awesome, awesome. Okay, no, I'm happy with that. So without any waste of time, let me call my amazing people and how everything is going to work out is that we have four rounds for this session. We have the first round where we will get to know our speakers, you know, a bit more and understand their entrepreneurship journey, which problems are they solving. And then we have the second round. This is that round whereby you have to listen because most of the times we wouldn't have access to these people or if we do get access, they will be a bit pricey. So this is where we're going to ask them the questions that we would usually pay for just to sit in the same room with them. So as and when I'm asking them these questions, be aware that the third round, you'll have your opportunity to ask them questions. So we keep on thinking about what do you want to ask them. And then, last but not least, in the fourth round, that is when we will close everything up and then we'll wrap up everything that we have learned, right? So get ready for your poetry session. Make sure that even your, you know, your hands are, are, are actually moisturized so that you don't kill those thumbs. Um, so yeah, now let me call my panelists. Firstly, we have Refilwe Maluleke from Yellowwood. Next, Refilwe, you can come here. Awesome. And then secondly, we have Sylvester Chauke from DNA Brand Architect. Let's see, Sylvester Chauke, is Sylvester around? Are you still brushing your hair, spraying something? <laughs> okay, maybe Sylvester's coming. I hope Sylvester's coming. Uh, probably it's just a matter of touch-ups. And then thirdly, we have Talifani Banks. Talifani, I love your head. Awesome. Thank you, Talefani. Talefani is coming. And then we have a representative from Brand SA, which is Tony Kumete. Tony Kumete, you can come closer. Awesome. Awesome. So Tony is not brushing her hair. That's amazing. And then last but not least, we have Tabelo Rapara from Maido SA. Awesome. So now we're going to kick it off, unless if we can get a confirmation around whether Sylvester is on the way. Sylvester. Okay, Sylvester is on the way, but then, you know, he's a branding guy, so I think what I like about this is that as he walks in, we'll get to understand about his branding and how he's positioned. So he can just walk in and, you know, I'll give you guys that challenge of seeing where he's positioned himself. But then we're not going to waste any further time we're just going to get into it. So we're going to start with our round one, as and when we wait for Sylvester. Thank you for joining me. Um, thank you, thank you for joining me. This is going to be a fun session. And guys, don't, don't forget the thumbs, eh? Don't forget the thumbs. Um, so with regards to our round one, our round one, we would like to 
know our panelists um, a lot better. But then, before we get to know them, I just want to start by saying, you know, I'm so grateful to be born in Africa, specifically in South Africa. And, uh, you know, even when you look at the stats, you look at the UN talking about how um, we, in Africa, you have the youngest population, right? You have um, most, around 70% of the population is under 30. So that excites me because we have energy, we have the young people, we have great possibilities, right? And then you also have the, uh, the, 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 the World Bank as well, also talking about the fact that in 2050, you'll be having one out of four people who are actually residing in sub-Saharan Africa. So that excites me because now I'm thinking, okay, this is telling us that there are opportunities in Africa. And maybe other people want to take on these opportunities, but then also that means we can do something about these opportunities as well, right? But then what we all know is that in as much as there can be opportunities, that also comes with challenges as well. So now I do have my panelists, which are like my soldiers, who are going to tell us how can we position ourselves better to take on these opportunities and to tackle these challenges. So now, let's uh, start with um, Ausrefilwe. And actually, Ausrefilwe, there's Ausrefilwe, okay. <laughs> okay, so Ausrefilwe, with regards to um, where you are currently in your business, I would like you to just briefly introduce yourself to our people and also tell us, with regards to your position and your industry, how do you define great positioning? And how do you define um, even business development so that you can position yourself well? You can go ahead, Osafile. Uh, good evening, Zana. Thank you for that warm introduction. And yes. uh, good evening to all of you as well. Um, as she mentioned, yes, my name is Rifilwe, and I'm the managing director of a company called Yellowwood. Uh, what we do at Yellowwood is really brand and marketing strategy consulting. So we help you figure out, you know, what should your brand stand for in a way that will help you drive the growth you're looking for. Um, so that's where, I am, where I'm from and, and, and what we do. And, and yes, we do operate um, in South Africa, but we service many countries across um, this great continent we call home. Um, and if I revert to your question around what makes great positioning or when you're building your own brand. Honestly, I think there's only three things that you need to get right uh, when defining your brand. Uh, the first is relevance, the second is credibility, and the last is distinction. Um, and, and to explain a bit more what I mean, uh, with relevance is really understanding what is the problem you're solving for your customer or client. And I'm sure you've heard that a thousand times and heard it probably over the last couple of days as well. Um, but really understanding the problem you are aiming to solve for is incredibly important. Otherwise, you have no reason for anyone to want to buy what you're selling. Um, and I think spending time understanding that and how to um, articulate it is important. The second part was credibility. Um, which is really, can you solve it? <laughs> which sounds really simplistic, but you know, if you've identified um, a, a real gap um, or a problem in, in the market that you wanna solve for, you've got to make sure that you can solve for it incredibly well, right? Do you have um, the skills, the capabilities um, to be able to solve for that problem? And the third point is distinction i.e. you can solve for that problem um, in a way that other people, your competitors, either can't um, or are choosing not to, you know, that they're not going to do that. And I think if you can, if you can ask yourself those three questions, you know, what does it that my client needs um, that I can solve for that the people around me um, either can't or won't, um, the answers to those three questions will help you figure out um, how you position your brand and yourself um, and will help you decide, you know, what it is you're going to do going forward um, and more importantly, to also decide what you're not going to do. Um, as your businesses grow and scale and people get excited about it, there'll be temptations to want to take on all sorts of things um, that are actually not right for you, not right for your business. Um, and, and I think when you know the answers to those three questions, it makes it a lot easier um, to know where to put your energy, your resources, and to know when to say no. So that's wow. the answer. 
That's a great start. <laughs> That's really a great start. Thank you, Osra Filwe. You know, guys, poetry session, poetry session, right? We agreed on that. Um, thank you for that because my aim for today was for us to actually empower our audience with practical strategies, right? So I like that you already started with three things that I hope they noted down, um, and it's very practical. Thank you, Osra Filwe. So next, uh, Talifani, if you can also give us a brief intro and tell us what great positioning means to you as well. Um, I'm coming from analytics advertising. It's a data technology company. We deal software solutions. We have data engineers. Some of them are from here, yeah, but they, some did aerospace. It's amazing. It's a great space to learn. We, we build solutions for B2B markets, from the FMCG, retail, insurance, telecommunications. Uh, we find ourselves giving consumer insights to this business, giving them direction, helping them to understand their customer behavior, helping them to position themselves right. Now, coming to position, um, what I understand about um, business overall, if you are an entrepreneur, you want to position yourself different to what everyone else is doing. If you want to get a piece of the market, you have to be deliberate about differentiating yourself. We are a data company. Nobody um, in my world right now, and how I see it, is pushing so much momentum in. That's how we're doing it. It's because we position ourselves like that. If you are going to be an entrepreneur who is going to get a piece of that pizza, you have to be different in the market, and you have to be known to be first in that category. So my understanding of our positioning is differentiating yourself to attract. Mm. I like that. Thank you very much, Talifani. And it's interesting because you are from more... Oof, I like that. Oof, <laughs> I love that. <laughs> um, I like the fact that you spoke about differentiating, but at the same time, you're speaking about numbers. So I can't wait for us to get to round two, where we see how do we link that? How do I then use my numbers so that I can uh, differentiate myself? Thank you for that. And Tony, right? Now we're getting the right name. <laughs> Um, so, um, do you mind giving us a brief intro as well as um, maybe from your side, um, when it comes to business development, what are your views with regards to that as well? So, yes, I'm from Brand South Africa and I'm Tony, Dr. <laughs> Filo. And um, the responsibility that is on the nation brand entity as Brand South Africa is, is to really package the country um, one, from an outward perspective internationally as well as domestically, uh, position the country as a competitive destination for trade and investment. And we do that in many ways um, in, in, in terms of managing the reputation, um, proactive and reactive communication as well as marketing of the nation brand. So um, one of the most important things since the establishment of Brand South Africa was um, to really strike a balance between um, selling the brand at an international level for competitiveness, mm -hmm. um, as well as ensuring that you don't attract um, an audience of investment and traders from outside mm -hmm. only to find a highly unpatriotic uh, South Africa here, because then that does the exact opposite. Mm -hmm. So one of the most important things in terms of the domestic aspect uh, of the mandate is to really um, promote the brand and reasons to believe amongst South Africans and to believe in a country faced with challenge, but that is also very resilient. That's um, one of the very key and important characteristics of the nation that we are, um, having come from the kind of history that we come from. And one, one of the um, things that Brand South Africa really prides itself on, on communicating is the innovation, the uniqueness and of the offering um, and, the, and the aspirant businesses and entrepreneurship that is coming out of the country. So we do work very closely um, in terms of supporting, profiling uh, some of the best, I, I would call it putting the country's best foot forward, mm. not only in the country in terms of the work that we have uh, done previously, but also now beyond the borders. I mean, we've got entrepreneurs that are um, beyond the borders now, you know, uh, many of them that we collaborate with to to support package um, they are offering as the best in the world coming from South Africa. So of course, um, before Sylvester gets here and takes over um, this kind of topic, but aspects such as um, country of origin are very important because there are a lot of um, innovations and, and, and brands that come out of this country that are doing very well out there, 
that are not very much easily associated with the country because we simply haven't put enough effort in, in perhaps associating with them as a country, owning the narrative, because at the end of the day, all we can have all the greatest offering um, from an entrepreneurship perspective, but if the world doesn't associate it with us, it doesn't help us build nation bread. So we have to own it, mm -hmm. because if we don't tell our own story, somebody's going to, and they will build their own narrative. We have some of the most brilliant innovations that are enjoyed across the globe from this country and from the continent, mm -hmm. and we, we really need to own it, considering that if, if the stats that you've just cited, that we are a very young continent, that literally means without trying to sound frilly and, and making everybody feel nice, we are the future, the future is here. And we simply need to own that, do what we can with mm -hmm. it in packaging and supporting um, entrepreneurs in any way that we can as different entities. Mm -hmm. oh, I really like what you said because it just made me think about, you know how you'd go into the UK or like go to Scotland and you see how they preserve their history and they're so proud of it. And you can see that this is from this place. But then I like how you're saying, in as much as yes, we can have all of these opportunities, but when we actually putting ourselves out there, is it resembling that South Africa we wanted to resemble? That's, that's a very, very good point. And thank you for that. And I can't wait for Sylvester to come and actually speak on that brand positioning and that uh, you know, distinguishing factor as well, especially from South, uh, South Africa's perspective. And I think what I like as well about you joining us today is that when you're speaking about positioning yourself, uh, we do have entrepreneurs here that are positioning themselves, but I like how, from your perspective, is positioning the whole of South Africa. So I think from your statement as well, so many people can actually resonate as well because um, it's like you're representing all of us as well in different views. So thank you for that, Tony. And last but not least, uh, Tabelo, uh, do you mind introducing yourself and just give us um, um, your thoughts on great positioning and business development? Thanks, Anele. Um, my name is Tabelo. Um, I would love actually to just, I grew up under trucks, you know, my dad was a mechanic. I grew up in entrepreneurship, um, became a CA, and did my master's in research in how the enterprise and supply development in South Africa is impacting black businesses, you know, and the impact around that, and what are black entrepreneurs finding out of it, you know, hence the space I'm in. Uh, my dough is an incubator and second accelerator for businesses, um, and, in, and an entrepreneurship academy where we support businesses. My business is to support you as a business. You know, every single day I find solutions for you as a business owner and how do we help you think about access to market? How do we think about community? How do we think about business support? You know, um, that's what we do on a daily basis. You know, um, we think about businesses from anyone doing 50,000 to someone doing 50, 60 million rands annually. So those are the businesses we engage with, we support. And really, I would say, um, for us is we engage entrepreneurs where they are. For me, it's very important. I'm a CA, right? And it's easy for me to talk about valuations. But what's valuation to a BSc student? You know, so for us, it's critical that we, when we solve um, ESD problems, for us, as my do, we actually reach the entrepreneur where they are. And in terms of brand positioning and, and um, business development, for us it's critical to understand the, the user challenge. You know, who's your user? Who are you offering the, your product to? And, and problems evolve, right? Um, today it might be this, tomorrow it's evolved to the next thing because of the changing world. So for us it's important to pay attention to your user and the changing needs. Mm -hmm. Secondly, you need to adapt as a business. How are you evolving as a business? You know, the world has taken, taken us through, you know, the past two years, we've seen how the world has evolved from a tech perspective. Where are you in that whole spectrum as a business and what you're offering? Mm. So that is critical. Mm. Amazing. Thank you. Ooh, poetry is back, guys. <laughs> poetry is back. Thank you. Thank you. We actually have amazing panelists, right? So I think for a moment, let's just give them a round of applause <laughs> because they are amazing. And I like what you said, Tabelo, about meeting the entrepreneur where they are. It doesn't make sense to sell someone who just started a business of selling my keep keep about business plan. Like for me, I'm just a bad still though. You know, they're still solving the whole problem of how do I get the next meal, right? So I like the fact that at my door, you are already looking at in positioning yourself, 
let's not try to come up with a whole huge strategy, but then it's all about where are you, right? So thank you, thank you for that, Tabelo. And that is the end of our round one. Let's get into round two. This is where we are getting our money's worth. We didn't pay them, but you know, we'll pretend like we paid them some consulting fee. So to start off our round two and just get to um, uh, ask you questions with regards to your expertise that can help our audience. And this is where the poetry session, I know it's gonna get deep because you guys are going to tell us some of the things that we don't usually get to engage with. So Osre Filoe, <laughs> Osre Filoe from uh, Yellowwood, right? So how I think of it, because we are in a youth entrepreneurship expo, um, as an entrepreneur already, uh, you guys are solving the problem of actually keeping an eye on the future. And what I like is that you guys at Yellowwood, you've been doing for around 17 years, you've been doing these surveys with the young people, where you're trying to find out, you know, what are the trends, what's happening, right? So that the young people can actually have an influence in the future and they can position themselves well so that they can be able to take advantage of the market. So if you don't mind sharing with us the type of insights you get as and when you conduct your Gen Next uh, survey, especially when it comes to the type of trends that maybe the young people should be looking into. Sure, so uh, you're absolutely right. We have been running Gen X for, for quite some time. Um, and it's an incredibly difficult question because there's very many things we find out of that survey. Um, but I guess I'll, I'll, I'll pick just a couple that I think are um, relevant in, for people looking at new ideas and uh, thinking about how to grow uh, your small businesses. Um, the one thing that came out of the survey uh, uh, last year, um, or actually two things that I think were incredibly uh, powerful, um, were really around, you know, what is it that attracts young people to, uh, to brands? Um, and yes, everybody's tempted to say it's all the cool stuff, right? It's, um, I don't know, having Bonang talk about your brand, I'm not sure if that's still a cool thing. Um, or, or, you know, being featured on a relevant uh, by a musician um, or the right influencer. But what was interesting is that one of the big drivers for young people in choosing brands um, is actually quite a fundamental thing, which is just accessibility, right? Um, so can I not only find your product, i.e. is it available in places that, that I can find it, um, but can I afford it? Is your offering affordable? It's one of the reasons I really enjoyed the presentation from the Fresh Mo gentleman, because I feel like he's really thought about that. Um, is it in places where I am? Do I have to work hard to find your product? Um, because so, so much is inaccessible to young people. So much that they are exposed to, that they are told about, um, that is uh, communicated and spoken about is actually not accessible to them. Um, and I think that brands who are able to make that a reality, and not just brands, people, who are able to make that a reality for young people um, have an enormous amount of power going forward. And that links to the second part of the, you know, the, the, the work that came out last year, um, which was really about the ability to, to kind of explore and, and, and play a bit with your identity. Um, what's changed over the last, I guess, 15, 20 years with the prevalence of things like social media um, is that it's actually very hard to play with your identity. I think, um, you know, uh, I remember Will Smith said it gosh, many years ago when his son did some, said something really embarrassing on Twitter. Um, and he was like, yeah, I probably would have said the same thing when I was 19. It's just that only 10 people knew about it as opposed to 50 million people. Um, and that's the reality, right? Or the, the benefit we had growing up of playing with your identity, of trying things, of experiencing things, of making mistakes, lots and lots of mistakes. Um, you know, young people don't have that today because the consequences seem to live forever. Um, they are, you know, memorialized on all these platforms that we have. Um, and I think, you know, again, finding ways to help young people experience things and try things and play with their identity without committing to it forever um, is an incredibly rich space. Um, and if you can combine those two things by making experiences accessible 
um, to to ordinary young people, um, I really think the, the the businesses and brands that are able to unlock that um, have a huge amount of power in the future. And to be honest, even if it's in the smallest, you know, the tiniest way, right? Um, like trying a um, what was it? Apple blush, I think. Trying an apple blush mouthwash. I was like, that's that's interesting. I've never <laughs> ever thought about that. But experiences don't have to be huge. It doesn't have to be flying in a private jet. Think about the stuff that you take for granted that you got to experience, um, and how do you make that a reality uh, for for young people everywhere? I like that. I really, really do like that. Um, and I'll always get back to my promise of, you know, let's make it more practical. Let's talk about accessibility. When it comes to that, what does it mean for an ordinary entrepreneur? Does it mean, let me be on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, everywhere, so that's accessible? Or does it mean, let me partner up with a courier company so that people can order from anywhere? Um, for you, when it comes to accessibility, especially in South Africa, um, you know, how is it, especially for, let's say, an entrepreneur from Soweto selling mouthwashes? Access, maybe let's talk about accessibility first, yeah. I knew you'd ask the hard question. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, unfortunately, there isn't a one size fit all. I think it's, you know, every entrepreneur has to figure that out for him or herself. Um, and I've seen every solution you're talking about manifests, right? So um, people who make cakes and, um, you know, uh, promote them on socials like Instagram, etc., cetera, um, where you must go and collect it, but the point is you can find them uh, in where you are, which is socials. Um, people who do arrangements with career companies, um, people who go to centralized venues uh, to, to, to market what they do. And so I don't think there's a one size fit all. Um, I think again, it's about understanding who is your consumer um, and what does accessibility look like to them. So if I go back to um, the example of, um, and there are many of them, people who make baked goods, cakes and cupcakes and whatnot, and promote it on social platforms, um, the reality is they are targeting me, right? Who's going to buy a birthday cake for my son? Um, and if I'm going to get a personalized birthday cake with super strikers on it, um, I actually don't mind driving to go and fetch it. That's okay. I'm, I have the means to do it, and I'm going to do it. But... If we're talking about a three rand seventy five sachet of mouthwash, you might want to think about a slightly different distribution model um, as the gentleman was talking about right mm -hmm. so um, I think it depends on your product and it depends on understanding your consumer what is possible for them, what is feasible for them, um, and of course what 's feasible for you as a as, as an entrepreneur mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you guys let 's get back to some poetry session there uh, thank you, thank you for that and I like what Osrifile said because now I'm hoping that you're thinking about your specific problem when it comes to accessibility, your specific problem when it comes to your identity and the type of experience that you're creating for your consumers as well. So when we get to round three, when we ask for the questions, I hope you're going to come up with your specific problem where you're saying, Osrifile, you said it's not one size fits all. This is me. This is my size. How can we solve my problem, right? So please jot down your questions because we can't wait to hear that. Thank you for that. And I think now you just launched us well to uh, Talefane. Um, I really am intrigued by what you do because it is data analytics and it can, I don't know, sometimes it, it looks like it's intimidating because when I think about it, I think about zeros and black screens and so many things happening, right? And now, just to bring it back to our audience, when it comes to data analytics and actually being in a position whereby you are using data to make decisions. For example, Osri Fila just said, you have to know your customer and when you have that intel on your customer, you can make decisions. So maybe just touch on what are the benefits of actually using data to make the decisions and how does, how, how does that look like in terms of a small business using data to make decisions? Maybe let's just bring it down to our level so that we don't think of it as something that is a bit more intimidating. Um, can I start where I do what I do now? Yes, please. Yes, please. Uh, we work one of the large corporations in FMCG, the Cell Cement, number one cement company. Mm. We build the technology that understand their consumer insights, mm -hmm. that's connected to their master data of the guys who are buying from them, who use their cash bills. And, mm -hmm. and also, this technology is supposed to connect the production. What you are trying to do, you're trying to help the business understand how many units to produce at a given demand. Mm -hmm. So you come in the consumer insights, uh, the model is called 
short with the reward solution that helps the business understand the behavior of customer. So now you're telling the business, this is what the end user do with your cement. They buy it for this. This is where the opportunity is. If you are going to produce a given unit, this is what you should be targeting. This is the market. So for a small business, <laughs> I'm thinking, I used to trade at a, I used to sell at a train station club when I started. I started very early. And um, we used to sell the same thing. We were selling oranges, bananas. And so I'm assuming you're not doing that. You know, <laughs> we need to do smart things. You know. uh, if you're an entrepreneur, in my mind, you shouldn't be doing anything that is saturated, that there's no money. You have to be doing something that's intentional and it will allow you to bring people to work with you. So I'm assuming this is a startup, maybe you are alone or you have got two, three people working with you. You want to uh, first start with the um, suppliers that you are working with. You want to understand how much to get from them and at what cost. So data science is important because before you make a deal with the supplier, you have to understand the market, the market price, and how they are selling. So when you agree on a cost price with the supplier, be very intentional on what you are going to sell. When you get into the business, you cannot be competing on a market price. If, let's say, you're selling what? Uh, um, fresh more. Mm. But I, I like the price. I like it. I like it. <laughs> We're going to talk. Um, you, you want to be different. Maybe you don't want to be, I like your pricing as well. You don't want to be only different on price, but in how you position yourself and how you distribute. So um, when you make a deal, cut a deal with the supplier, try and find the best price and best raw materials to cut to get the price. Now that you've got a product and you've got a best price, a penetration price, which allows you to get in, mm -hmm. you have to be very clear on what type of market you are targeting. In my world, there's, um, there's a budget customer, there's a core customer, and there's an upper core customer. Mm -hmm. Is your mall fresh mall targeting budget, or is everyone? Mm -hmm. If it's everyone, now we go to product level, product segmentation. Is it an entry level? Is it, they call it, um, we call it um, um, entry, it's like an entry level uh, product, or is it an A brand, or is it a, a premium brand? Mm -hmm. So when I think about fresh mall, it's an entry level, it's a price fighter kind of pipe price. So you want to get in there. I've seen some mouthwashes that are in containers, so they are very priced around 50 rand, 40 rand. Um, you want to get in there and penetrate with your pricing. So for you to be able to penetrate, understand how these guys are positioned and try and be positioned different. I saw that you've got the, the shop right and many others. So I, maybe I can help with the pick and pay. Um, but the whole point is that when you get into the market, you want your category to be first. You want people to walk in there and prefer your product. So that's where data science is important. You want, it, it helps on segmenting your product and also segmenting your pricing. Mm, yes. I like that. Um, thank you for that. And, I, and thank you for actually applying it. Oof, guys, I like that. <laughs> it always gets me. It's like I forgot that we're doing it. And then when you do it, I'm like, yay. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you for that, Talifani. Um, and I like the fact that you use Freshmore uh, because now it's a business that we all know, especially from this room, right? So now when it comes to data analytics, um, especially when it comes to our audience as well, what I would really like to understand is that you spoke about a system that you use, of which it sounds like a pricey system. I don't know if our young entrepreneurs can really afford that. So. Taking it back to our young entrepreneurs, let's say maybe they can't afford the system and maybe they can't really, um, you know, put in the data so that you can guide them. How does that look like for them? Does it look like taking a piece of paper and actually saying, in my blog in Soweto, we have about 50 households and out of these 50 households, Three of them, they want my archer. So because of that, then I have to segment it like this and I have to sell it on that corner. Like maybe let's, let's take it there with regards to data, using data at a position whereby maybe you only have a cell phone or you just have a laptop. How do we use it so that we can position ourselves for success? Um, I'm struggling to get a, an exa a clear example, but I'll always go to Fresh. Yes, please. Yes, please. So Fresh more to me is in two ways. There's a B2B channel and a B2C channel. So I mean business to business. 
in my mind, I want to understand how many units I should be distributing to the retailers. So I need to know them. And I need to know how much they are buying at cost from the others. So data science is nothing complex in this case. It's not a lot of retailers you're supplying to, but you want to understand those guys, how much do you think they are getting their, um, the, pro the mouthwash or, or whatever that is existing at what cost price. So you, it's just a basic research. You can do this yourself. If you are selling directly to the customer, you want to know people who buy this fresh more mouthwash, what do they do? Where are they found? What is their main problem? What causes their problem? Then you talk that. If, if smoking causes mouth problem, you talk smoke, you help smokers. Mm -hmm. And your messaging then is translated from there because now you know your customer. Mm -hmm. So what data science helps you is to unpack the behavior of that customer and what they do. Mm -hmm. And you want to position yourself as first. Like, so I'm saying this as, as a main thing. For sure. So if I was uh, selling in a uh, toothpaste category, I would be a Colgate. What I'm trying to say is you want to be first. So yes, you are selling this fresh ball. You want to sort of categorize it in such a way that it's helping people who smoke, people who have what, what problems, uh, health yes. problems. Mm -hmm. Then in that problem, you become the only one. Yes. Then you talk that. Then in my mind, who else competes with you? Mm. So what we lack every time when we position our product, we always say, no, my product is good. I won't say that. Mm. But there's a lot of companies that do the same thing that we do. But I say that we create, we are the innovative company in data and data science. And when you see it, you will, you'll recognize. But with Freshmore, I would say, find out where the most market is of people who have a challenge of mm -hmm. heart problems. And then you speak that. Awesome. Thank you. I like how practical that is. Um, so let's take it from, because I really like the gentleman from Freshmore as well. So how that would look like, because I'm guessing his main challenge is sales and also funding, right? So, so maybe if we can take it a step down as well and then say, yes, we want to understand this. We want to understand our customer better. So for him, does it look like him always saying, when I approach my customers, these are my three questions. And then these questions, the responses, I'm going to document them in my notebook or in my Excel. How, how in a practical sense for him, can he gather that data so that he can make the decision? Yeah, let's say I'm a CEO of Freshmore. Yes. <laughs> I am not going to sell directly to people. I don't have the time. Mm. I have kids. <laughs> <laughs> I am going to find a way to distribute. I actually have a supplier that I'm going to give you. Um, um, it's called Yabo Fresh in Cape Town. We mm. help them with data. They work with puzzle shops and um, so many of them. So what you want to do is to create a relationship with fresh. Mm. Uh, then you say, no, you know what? This is demanded in the what, what, what I'm doing is I have the marketing mm -hmm. and um, I just want you for distribution channel. These guys order from you units and they move it. Yes, it's going to be a challenge to get that, but what we lack every time when we launch our products, our marketing is poor. We don't even, nobody knows what you're doing. I used to be a pricing analyst at Pick and Pay. I used to advise the buyer to buy a product, mm -hmm. and then it goes to transactions. So because I was his brain, I'm trying to help him cut the best deal. But a, cust a supplier who comes with the right market does not need the retailer. The retailer needs him mm -hmm. because he's already known. Mm -hmm. So you need to push marketing on your product so that when you now go to Fre um, Yabo Fresh and say, I would like you to distribute, you tell them, I already have the market in the Houghton region. Mm. All I need is distribution. As soon as you buy this, it's moving. Mm. Mm. That's mm. what I would do. I like that. I really, really, really like that. And also, if you want to add, guys, we have I more. Do. I really do want to <laughs> add something because I think it is a really important question. Yes. Um, and in, in, in your, your point around, you know, what are the, what are the practical things that um, the Freshmo CEO, for example, could do? I feel like his business is getting an enormous amount of promotion today. Um, it really is exactly what um, uh, we were talking about now, that you need to understand uh, what is motivating your target customer. And if that is a retailer, so spa or discam or whatever, 
make it your business to find out what they want. And because we know retail, what matters the most to them is margin. How much money am I as pick and pay or spa or discim gonna make off your product? And how do you then structure your pricing, all of that kind of thing, so that the margin that they will make off of it is attractive? Um, because, and you know, it's completely right what Cliff is saying, that you must market your product and all of that. But when you know that, when you know that the only thing they really care about is margin, they actually don't care about you or your brand or your product um, it helps you think about how you're going to sell it to them um, and how it is you're going to structure your offering for them um, and that information you just need to look for it mm -hmm. you know what do we how do retailers honestly google how do retailers make decisions about the products inside their portfolio it's about margin which is the amount of money they make off of it and think and look at it in 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 in, in that kind of way Thank you. Thank you for that. And I think what you just uh, mentioned as well as what Tadefani uh, was, was, was mentioning now is maybe starting with, is your customer B2B or B2C? Are you selling to businesses or are you selling to consumers? Because based on that, then how you gather data is completely going to be different, right? So taking that into account, remember we're coming to our round three. I want your specific questions on that uh, because you might be in B2B space, you might be in B2C space. Uh, give us your, you know, the issues, those burning issues. I want to get them from you. So now we've been speaking about how to position yourself from also Phil as well as Talifani. Thank you for that. But then now that maybe you might have positioned yourself, um, there might be opportunities from Brand SA. Are there any initiatives that, uh, Tony, you can tell us that you currently, uh, you're currently doing for the African youth uh, from Brand SA's side? And maybe some of them, is there anything that um, is currently hip and happening now that our current audience can just uh, hop on and, 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 and just take advantage of what you're doing for them? Um, so one of the programs that we have domestically is called Play Your Part, which is an active citizenship program mm -hmm. where we have, um, in the recent past, and we still do so, profile um, different individuals across different communities and sectors who are doing something to make an impact. And it, 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 it varies. It's a very diverse program. But in terms of the entrepreneurship space, what we have done was... Um, Look for um, people doing things that are innovative, that are new, that are agile. Um, I mean, if you just think about the past two years, one of the key things that businesses needed to be in order to survive was to be adaptable and agile in terms of how they access uh, their market in, in, you know, in a time where at some point you couldn't be physically anywhere. Mm -hmm. And obviously there was a big move to the digital space to you know, selling products on Instagram as well as other um, digital platforms. So as Brand South Africa, one, one of, of the things that we have done was to profile and give a platform to those entrepreneurs who are doing different things. And I mean, this has been through um, uh, Play Your Part where we packaged it for TV. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think um, to date we've had over 50 episodes you know, and they're still alive on YouTube if you want to, um, you know, see some of the stories there. But uh, since we, and th this was on SABC too, but what we currently do is do the same uh, for, you know, innovators, movers and shakers, disruptors, um, profile them and on, on digital platforms. Uh, so that's currently what we're doing. And it could be either affording them speaking platforms to showcase themselves. We collaborate with other entities like Proudly South African, um, to, to, you know, give space for entrepreneurs um, to showcase their services and their products. So that's just some of the stuff that uh, Brands of Africa has done to um, support the entrepreneurship space. And then at a larger scale abroad, businesses that are ready to be on the um, people like Inga, we've collaborated and profiled him before, um, he, you know, he makes leather goods. Um, and uh, one of the media partnerships that we, we, we have what's with CNN, so his stuff has been on awesome. CNN, you know, so that's just some of the stuff that we have done. Um, at a different scale, what we are currently busy with is uh, uh, a play your part, but we call it play your part business edition, mm -hmm. and uh, what we are doing, we are targeting TVET colleges in a program where um, entrepreneurs in that space can get to interface with and showcase their businesses either seeking funding or support or skills mm -hmm. to business leaders that we collaborate with for them to 
table their stuff too. And, and they can get um, financial support and non-financial support as well through that program. Mm. I really like that. I really like that because I think um, there was also one of the businesses that they were speaking about access to market because most of the times they don't have access to market. So I really do acknowledge that you're playing a huge role in actually putting these people in front of the people that can uh, provide some business. So with regards to maybe um, you know, the success that you've had, so most of the times when you do profile an entrepreneur, because I just want our audience to know that should they be profiled, you know, they're going to get sales or something like that. Do you perhaps track, um, maybe let's say they're featured on CNN or something like that, do you have perhaps track how someone was maybe selling 50 fresh moles, but then now they're selling 500 fresh moles? Is there something that maybe from your side, from Brenda, say you are tracking the growth due to the intervention of profiling the young entrepreneurs? Um, look, because we are not in the business as Brand South Africa of actual transaction, we're mm. in the business of profiling and packaging um, the nation brand as mm -hmm. competitive. And we, we obviously use people like entrepreneurs who are doing well to showcase that yeah. the South African nation brand is a strong brand. Sure. This is what we produce. These are our people. People um, is one of the uh, nation brand enablers, we call mm -hmm. it. So people who are doing great things in their spaces are nation brand um, enablers. They are, of course, disablers, sure. which is not what mm. we are going to talk about now. Yeah. But um, on our part, it is to showcase that this is what we have. These are the assets. These are the, uh, this is what's coming out of this country. We, we are ready. Our, our entrepreneurs are ready for export. And you know, this is what we do. So I think in terms of tracking, it's, it would be more. And, and also, I think it gets a little bit tricky for us to try and track because we aren't focused on the actual transaction um, simply because it, is, it will be very difficult to say we ascribe this growth to this for particular sure. initiative because mm -hmm. there are so many other platforms. And for we sure. do, uh, I mean, our business is mostly centered on being able to collaborate with other people. Mm -hmm. So I think it would be a little bit unfair of us I to want to yeah. ascribe then the success mm -hmm. to just brand South Africa, but certainly yes. as the ones who would have given at least some platform oh. for that mm -hmm. um, entrepreneurial business yes. um, or organization to profile mm. itself, we can certainly say we are part of the, the, mm. the success mm. story of that business. I, I, I really like that because I think your statement just took us back to where we started, where you were saying, how are we owning, you know, like um, the, the, the core of South Africa and how are we showing that to the world so that we can show that we're ready to export, we're ready to do all of these things. So I like how you have explained that brand South Africa is, is, is mainly now we're showcasing that these people are, you know, African, they're bringing African products and they're owning every, uh, all of it. So when it comes to the profiling of the young entrepreneurs, how can our young people apply maybe to be part of play your part and what can they do so that they can also uh, be profiled on your platforms as well? Okay, so um, play your part uh, as a brand South Africa uh, active citizenship program lives on all the digital platforms from Instagram, Twitter, um, Facebook, and um, we welcome interaction and interface. Uh, within the play your part program, we have play your part ambassadors program, which is which we really use to um, celebrate uh, and profile. I think at this point we, we've had our first Play Your Part Awards where we want to recognize um, wow. a different, uh, I mean, South Africans doing different things um, and, and making successes um, out of themselves because that's part of the nation brand story. Mm -hmm. So please reach out to Play Your Part. Um, we, 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 we obviously, there's they some detail about how we want to verify and vet because it's very important to associate as a nation brand with um, brands and individuals that are doing positive things uh, without possibly running the risk of taking away from the good reputation that yes. we would be working mm. for. So um, obviously there's some vetting that goes into yes. it, but uh, really it's very diverse, young and old, across color mm. lines, across community um, profiles and demographics and mm. across business sectors okay. as well. Thank you. We have uh, Play Your Part ambassadors as young as 12, actually. Awesome. You know, and as old as oh, Mam Esther Mashang. So, yes. you know, Thank um, you. It's really open to yes. ordinary South Africans who are just doing extraordinary things in their own spaces. Awesome. So it's a matter of 
going on to Instagram, going on to the website, going on to Facebook, clicking, applying, being vetted, and then being profiled. Yes. Awesome. Like us, follow us, love us, interact with us. <laughs> awesome. Thank you, thank you, thank you for that. Guys, you would be pleased to know that Sylvester is finally done brushing his hair. <laughs> We've been waiting for him to finish touching up. Um, Sylvester, welcome. Welcome. Thank you so much. Um, I, I, couldn't, I couldn't wait to be here. I just f flew in from New York, um, landed at the airport and drove straight here. So um, I'm really, really glad I, I could make it and I'm sorry for my delay. No, awesome, because I like how it just works, right? I, I, I asked the audience when you, when you come in, I said you're the brand guy. They should try to see how you've branded yourself, where you are. And now it's like what you just said, you just flew in from New York. And our topic today is all about how do you position your brand? How do you position your business for success, both locally as well as internationally? You're from New York. We're hoping you came back with some dollars, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, so, Sylvester, other people here might not know who you are. So maybe if you can give us a brief intro of who are you and what's your take on positioning oneself? Mm. My name is Sylvester Chauke. I am the founder and uh, chief architect of a company called DNA Brand Architect. It's an award-winning agency. We're currently 2021 Agency of the Year, according to the Prisms. And in fact, being in New York, it was for the International Association of Business Communicators, where we were one of the companies that were appointed and also um, awarded the actual gold quill of excellence for the work we do for brands on the African continent. Um, we are a, 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 a young agency. Um, um, for us, it's 10 years that we've been in business. And in the 10 years that we've been in business, we have been fortunate to work with some of the most exciting brands on the African continent. We work with brands like Netflix, Apple, F&B, um, Paramount Plus, MTV Networks, Africa, etc. So we pride ourselves as an agency that's about amplifying what we can do as South Africans um, on the African continent as a whole. Because remember, international is not just outside of Africa, right? Yeah. <laughs> um, it's across um, outside of our border and being able to help brands to do a good job within the continent. Um, and I must say that in our journey, we have been able to see firsthand the opportunity that lies ahead with being able to position yourself. And, and I would be very wary of just, you know, for international uh, you know, uh, purposes, but it's also important that in your hometown, you're also relevant, are uh, utilized and engaged. So my take, and I, and, and I must say in 2019, we became the first agency to ever win the PRISM uh, campaign of the year in 22 years, mm -hmm. uh, a black-owned agency. Um, and, and, and we continue, yes, that's right. Um, <laughs> it, it is exciting, but it's also embarrassing, right? Mm -hmm. Considering the fact that yes. the PRISM have been in, 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 in our country for 22 years and only in 2019 we had a, a black-owned agency win. That is really embarrassing, even though it's exciting for us, but it, it shows you of the opportunity and the scale that's available for us to take into consideration. So when I think about my take around positioning, I think there are two elements that I consider quite important. The first is really around how you amplify your opportunities you have in country. So us being able to be represented in the um, award circuits that you have in your own country is very important. Us being able to amplify our brand so that when uh, corporate know or what corporate are looking for support from an agency like ours, they know who DNA Brand Architects is. So the positioning aspect for me is really about how you show up as a brand locally. And then of course, internationally, I mean, when we got a call from Apple, and Netflix, for an example, they were looking for a brand or a brand agency to assist them on the African continent, right? But they needed to see what was being done by our agency in our own country, because they can't just take us into international shows if we don't really showcase great effectiveness in market that we're in. So things like uh, the awards that we've won for our brands, the kind of clients that we work with, the kind of opportunities that we've been able to create for businesses and small businesses in particular, but also the um, work that we've been able to create for, you know, for brands. And, and, and the fact that we are award-winning and we continue to do that for brands um, has been one of the things that helps us to be able to then be noticed across other markets. Mm -hmm. And that's really the, the, you know, my take do good at home, amplify your positioning right here before. And then I think with time, for us it took about five years, if I'm honest, mm -hmm. uh, because we needed to cement our own positioning 
in market and to be known as a, a company that can deliver, that can do work at that level. But then, of course, after that, by having those accolades and having those kind of brands and having the kind of work we were doing, already starts, you know, inculcating what we're about, and then we, we then are able to get calls from international brands who we now work with across many markets. Wow, thank you, thank you for that. I love the point on amplifying brand, amplifying the brand and amplifying almost everything, because I think we've seen with what you do with the brands as well, um, I think you've been doing amazing. But then, um, just to, 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 to connect with our audiences, right? You've been in business for around 10 years. Now you've seen different things as well. I just want us to take it back to before you even started DNA Brand Architects, right? Um, because it looks like now you are very clued up when it comes to branding and everything, and, and you're emphasizing doing good at home and everything. Um, but then let's start with the young Sylvester. Mm. What are some of the uh, personal decisions that you made that got you to this position whereby you are like a star when it comes to branding and positioning yourself. Is there anything that maybe you can share with us so that maybe when it comes to our young entrepreneurs, as and when they're working into mm. positioning themselves and being able to amplify, um, perhaps what are the things that they can think about um, at their young age? And the reason I'm, 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 I'm talking about this is because you spoke about 10 years. And we are in the world whereby we want microwave results, right? Yeah. We, just, we just want results now. Yeah. So, so I just want our audience to also realize that, yes, it takes time. And you have also grown over time. Yeah. So maybe if you can just take us back with regards to the personal decisions that you had made that got us here, where we can even celebrate you that you mm. just came back <laughs> from New York. <laughs> um, that's quite a big question. I think I'll start by saying I never thought that I was going to be an entrepreneur. So I didn't see it as something that I was going to do. I grew up um, in Soweto, and what I wanted to do was get a job and work in the world of advertising. So I think the first thing that I think I'd, I'd love to share is the importance of being able to start um, at the bottom. And, and I know that it's, it's annoying to start at the bottom because you kind of want to already get to the top, you know? But I think that for me... Um, I knew that I wanted to be in advertising and brand communication. I then went to study marketing and brand communication. I went to intern at, a, at, at one of the most exciting advertising agencies in the country. Um, and I worked for, an, for a number of years in advertising. By the time I left advertising, I then went to work for, for, you know, as, you know, as a client. And I headed up Nando's Marketing for about five years. After heading up Nando's, I went to head up MTV Networks Africa as Director of Marketing and Communication before starting DNA. Mm -hmm. So for my, and my, my journey and my story is not to shy away from the opportunities to learn from people and from businesses. So I'm not saying that it's not possible for you to be 19 and then become a CEO of your own agency. It can be done. We've seen the Mark Zuckerbergs of this world, but very, 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 very small cases of those kind of successes. Um, and for me, the, 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 the power of being able to serve people, work in companies, learn from companies, and it took me 15 years of being in, 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 in the industry to be able to learn enough skills to eventually one day wake up and think, wait a minute, maybe I can become an entrepreneur, even though I thought I was going to be a businessman you know, forever. Um, and I think that th there's something to be said about the, the importance of being able to work in other people's businesses, to learn, because the opportunities there can also help to catapult you quickly when you get to an opportunity to, 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 to start your own agency mm -hmm. or your own business. Um, because you can play and learn so much using other people's <laughs> businesses <Yes>. um, <laughs> versus learning on your own. Um, <laughs> At least that's my experience, you know, and I think that's quite, um, you know, important. And I also take pride in the fact that when I was in, in, at, at university, I also worked at Macro, I worked at Dion, I worked at um, uh, a game stores, and I used to work in merchandising, and I used to serve customers. So that opportunity for me to, to know the value chain as a whole of what it takes to sell, what it takes to push product, I love that, and I think it helped me to to really become a better marketer in the future. So I understand it at the bottom level, and I can be able to amplify it with the experience I have over time. Mm -hmm. So I'd say 
don't frown upon those opportunities where you start as an assistant in someone's business or um, you know, um, helping um, someone else, volunteering your services to NGOs and, 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 and places that need your support, even at church, for example. Your ability to get involved mm -hmm. in helping people and seeing how things work can, can really be a, a, of, of great benefit. It certainly was of, of great benefit to me. Mm -hmm. And I, I think that the importance of that little step-by-step of being able to, to, to build a company allows for much more longevity um, and sustainability because you can test yourself. Am I doing it for the right reasons? Am I willing to do the work? Am I willing to, to graft when, it need, when it's needed? And I think for me, that's exactly what I think has been of, of great benefit because I respect that from the lowest level. Mm -hmm. um, that's what has helped me to get to this point. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, and guys, just for in the interest of time, I wanted to ask uh, Sylvester more about distinguishing oneself because that's the conversation that we've been having. But then for the interest of time, he'll talk about it in his outro. Um, so now I'm going to move forward to Tabelo. And thank you for that, Sylvester. So Tabelo, um, um, taking into account the fact that you've started several businesses and now you are the MD of my door where you putting the, as you said earlier on, you putting the, the, the entrepreneur at the center and you meet the entrepreneur where they are and you providing the support. Taking into, the, taking into account the fact that you are very knowledgeable in the ESD space, that is enterprise supplier development, maybe if you can let us know what is the role of ESD when it comes to ensuring that our SMEs or rather our small businesses are positioned well to take um, all the other opportunities that might be there in the market. Well, thanks, Zanella, for that. And I think, let me start here. <laughs> <laughs> I'll use myself as a case study, right? At 19, um, coming to varsity, first year, I started my first restaurant with a co-founder. Um, before classes, I'll go stock, get raw material uh, at lunchtime, come check whether our customers are coming, running back to school. Fast forward that, uh, I was in a space where um, we went into retail, clothing, we looked around, nothing is happening in South Africa, finding myself at 22 in the streets of China, trying to find where I can get clothes and come sell them in South Africa, right? Um, not understanding what import-export meant and how I can get the proper licensing, standing. Um, fast, fast forward to that, owning a shuttle company, a logistics company, and I needed licensing to um, ferry my passengers, right? Standing at the Department of Transport and wondering why it takes seven months to even talk to someone. You know, fast forward to that, um, owning a manufacturing company to responding to COVID. The shuttle company had to stop because everything had shut down, but how do I survive as an entrepreneur? And now finding myself um, looking for opportunities and the masks were the big thing. And to date now, we've moved on from you know, manufacturing masks, <laughs> since we're told we can't wear masks, to PPE, you know, um, servicing the mining industry, the food industry, pharmaceuticals, normal PPE, right? With all those, oh, I actually wore my shoes to demonstrate one of my products. This is a, a brand that um, a co-founder and mine did. Three, four years ago, right? Um, finding myself in the journeys, China, Turkey, Europe, trying to find the best material and all that, saying I can actually develop my own sneaker, right? Let me learn the best ways to do it. Developed one, right? But do not have funding to scale it. And I see the bar twos now and I'm excited. Um, so the reason why I'm saying this is, so why does ESD exist? It exists to help someone like me and you, you know? Mm. Not understanding where to find help, where to find information, who can find me, you know? I've started and co-founded a lot of businesses still doing that. Um, I'm a tech entrepreneur now with my partners. But ESD exists to help you and me figure things out. As black, it's targeted to black entrepreneurs or black people to redress past injustices. We all know what those are, right? It's important to know that it's okay not to know. I always emphasize these things. It's okay not to know, but it's more important to want to learn and ESD is a partner to you as an investor, as my do. We are an investor in your company. 
Look at someone investing their one million, right? And see how they give you calls. That's how much we invest in our entrepreneurs to say, how do we help you grow your company? Three things. Access to market, real access to market. You know, we, every ferry we talk about these things, but we've developed a product which we are using to scale. You know, um, previously before COVID, it was very manual, but evolving as well as my dough, we've got a platform. Um, it's on Android, it's on Apple Store, literally an app or a desktop um, 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 solution where we are now saying to entrepreneurs and our beneficiaries, we want to give you access to market. How do we do that? You trade with other entrepreneurs within the space. We've got over 1,000, over 1,500 entrepreneurs right now in the space. Trade with each other. We just launched a trading with each other um, feature two weeks ago, and we've got um, over 1,000, uh, 1 1.5 million that has been traded within the space. And then it tells you that actually, you know, we've got real money flowing, and we can actually trade and work and grow. We've got the tender corner, NEC. I'm, I'm actually glad that we, you know, she raised the issue around the, 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 the tender corner, the tenders and whatnot. Um, as young entrepreneurs, there's a tender that's out there. We are being told, go apply, you know, there's opportunities. But you sit there and you find, this is too big for me. Um, I'm small. Who can I uh, do this with? So our solution to that is you, you, you cannot allow an opportunity to pass you, right? And you're sitting alone in Soweto or in Umlazi, right? But who do you collaborate with? So our community, which is the second solution for us, building community for entrepreneurs, you are now able in our platform to connect to someone who is in branding, like I am, and saying there's a tender or there's a job opportunity, it's too big for me, let's collaborate, you know. And that's someone that you had previously not known, you know, and an opportunity goes by and you don't have the reference letters we're all <laughs> required to have, you know. So those are the type of pro problems we're solving collaborating with others, you know, partnering with others, or even finding opportunities not sitting in your own space, because there's an accounting job, but I don't know who in accounting I can, you know, refer the job to. Those are opportunities that we say, you know, we teach in our space to say, don't let an opportunity pass you by. Look at a commission structure, you know. You know, there's a, there's a, there's a, a gig that is in your space, you know. Um, Let's talk commission. If I refer this and the deal goes through, maybe 10, 15% sliding scale. Those are the discussions that we have to say, how do we help you with access to market with real, real sales? Access to you know, a community, um, like I'm saying, it's a global world. We are now solving, how do you connect to someone in New York? How do you, solve, you know, connect to someone in Brazil? How do I, as a graphic designer, do work for someone sitting in Monaco? You know, how do I go beyond South Africa? And I don't need to know someone or an uncle or whatever, because it's true, we all don't know a lot of rooms or we're not in a lot of rooms that, you know, unfortunately other people find themselves in, right? We've got to create rooms, we've got to find ways. So this is how, as my do we, you know, creating the, those opportunities uh, by giving community and access, con uh, you know, um, building a community for entrepreneurs. Literally, we are a platform like, you know, a lot of the social media platforms you find, but for business. We talk business, we talk how to empower each other and how to sell. Lastly, business support. Yes, you'll sell. Yes, there's community, you know, you'll collaborate. But wrap around service to building a solid professional company. We help with the back end stuff, we call it back end, the compliance, we help with the taxes, we help with, you know, brand positioning, we help with, um, Anything that has to do with how do I build systems? You know, I'm growing now. I've got, I'm, I was making 10,000. I'm making 300,000. I'm making 5 million. You know, there's processes that then comes through. How do you build those from scratch? How do you use three people, four people to run your business? You know, so that's the business support then that comes through. You know, so um, that's for me a response to what is ESD, you know, for, for, for a young entrepreneur who the three businesses that were presented here I looked at them like ah, this is this is my space this is my happy place how do we help you grow you know um, so th that's what we do and and that's how we respond to ESD and I'd love to say ESD must meet you where you are I've said it earlier you, you, you don't have to feel like you cannot tell me I don't know how to sell I don't have confidence you know 
I'll give an example. There's an actually, a lot of our entrepreneurs know what they do. They're excellent. But the challenge is they don't have business skills. And that's okay. You know, that's okay to say, let me get help. That's why ESD exists. If you go into a space where there's an ESD incubator and it's not um, available to help you with that, then I've got a fundamental problem. Because I need to meet you where you are, move you to the next level, and then it's so funny how entrepreneurs are just courageous. You'll see them fly. It's easy, you know. But you must be able to understand that you're talking to someone that, like I said, I cannot talk big valuation words and big bombers, you know, big words with someone that I can literally see. I first need to help them with their confidence to sell, you know. So that's, for me, ESD and what it should look like to help our entrepreneurs. Yeah. <laughs> so now with our people, let's try to... Oh, I thought everyone was hearing me all along. <laughs> so with regards to what you said, with regards to uh, meeting people where they are, let's meet our people where they are, right? So with regards to where they are, where they are sitting now, others from Soweto, others from all different parts of South Africa now, if they want to take advantage of ESD, if they want to come into my door and have the piece of the 1.5, what's the next practical step they can do so that they can get the piece of that pie as well? Um, there are many incubators in the country, I must be honest. Um, my door is a super one that would feel like, you know what, <laughs> we are disrupting the market in a sense of we're putting technology um, in the forefront. We want to scale, we want to, to have more reach, right? To, to your point, um, literally it's my door, you'll find us everywhere, right? Um, and you need to understand where your business is. Incubators solve different problems. Are you a startup? Are you still at ideation? Are you looking at your idea? Have you started a business? Is it, is it running? Um, or are you an established business? We cater for the different business stages. You know, we work with entrepreneurs, like I said, that are doing a thousand to 50, 60 million, and we're able to speak to where you are as a business. Mm -hmm. So it's available. Google that, then you will be able to get contact and take the conversations. But corporates, right, and government, for us are key partners because for us to deploy this support, we need the sponsorships to come through, right? Um, our model is... Um, there's a set budget by government. The act requires a budget to be spent. So we are able to use that budget to support you, right? Because for us to deploy all these things, to improve technology that we're using to deploy and support you, there must be an investment and money that we deploy. So we use those sponsorships um, as one of the tools that we, we are able to support you as an entrepreneur. So in our space, it's free for you as an entrepreneur. However, sponsors you know, help us deploy that and support you as an entrepreneur. Awesome. Thank Sorry. you. Thank you for that, Tavelo. So we are going to move on to round three and take your questions. I hope you have more. I, I hope you have more. Oh, look at that. I'm already seeing hands, which is good. Uh, do we have a person who will be giving our people mics or is... Oh, you oh, you grabbing a mic for our people. Okay. So whilst we are fixing the mic for the people, I'm just going to pose a question to Sylvester just to wrap up round two and say, Sylvester, let's say we have a person from our audience now. Mm -hmm. They get the opportunity to be part of an amazing incubator such as um, um, Maido, or they get an opportunity to uh, talk to people such as Osri Filo from Strategic Consulting, or they get to use their data analytics, or they can be profiled from Brand SA. How can these people actually and show that they can distinguish themselves yeah. because maybe it is Retabile selling ice cream, but then there are 20 more people selling ice cream. From your side, how can they position themselves so that you know, it can result in success both locally as well as internationally? Hmm. So I, I think that's such an important question because as business people, we experience a lot of people who come to us generally asking for support or help. And I think for me there are three things I, which are vital in being able to utilize as a young entrepreneur the opportunity that you have in front of someone. Um, the, the first one is how you show up. Um, very often, 
we receive really badly written proposals, badly written emails. Uh, people take for granted that someone is going to be reading that content and they don't spend enough time ensuring that it's ready for business. So the first thing for me that's quite important is as young people, when we have an opportunity in front of us, we do need to take full advantage of it. So package your things really well. Package your mail really well. Have a proper signature. Have a proper do document that is being sent across. Let it look good. Make sure that it's, it's got, um, you know, it, it's vetted for errors. Make sure that you address the, the people in the right way. I think for me, an entrepreneur who's serious, you can tell by the way they prepare, the way they, 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 they prepare themselves when they meet people. And quite often also, something as simple as when you are going to meet someone, do you know that person really well? Have you read about them? Have you been to LinkedIn? Where do they work? What have they, what have they done? So when you meet someone, you, you know what they come with. Don't come in and ask obvious questions like someone asking, what does DNA do when they come in to see us? It really is embarrassing. And, and you, it's not going to get you anywhere. So the opportunity for you to, to show up, first of all, is package well. Show up like you are ready to win. And that means your packaging of your things must be totally spot on. That's the first thing. The second thing that's very important is be buttoned up. You know, be buttoned up. What I mean by this is that know your numbers. Know the business that you are within, the industry that you're within. Many people will say they are in fashion, and yet they don't know who are the biggest sellers of fashion in the country. How come, right? So if you are in manufacturing, who are the biggest manufacturers in the country? Who are the biggest manufacturers in the world? So our ability to remember that school doesn't end once you get your degree, you've got to continue to learn and, and, and get yourself appraised with the industry that you are in. So in my world, because I'm the world of advertising and brand communication, I follow all the CEOs of, big, of great agencies around the world. I follow, I read all their annual financial results. I want to know how they make money. I want to know who they work with. So it's part of my weekend gig to just get to know what's going on in the industry that I'm at. So being buttoned up means that you know exactly your industry and you know it well. So that when you show up in front of someone, you are also showcasing that you've got the skill, the knowledge, and the ability to be able to to, to discuss. Do you agree with me on that? Because if someone came to you and they want to do business with you, you expect them yes. to be buttoned up in the area that they're at. I think that's quite important. And then the last point is um, copy. I know, I know this sounds bad, but let me explain. Who is an entrepreneur that you look at in the world and you think, that's how I want to I want to be, right? identify that entrepreneur and look at them, read their books. How do they work? How do they align? And of course, sometimes you're gonna see things that work for you and you're gonna see things that don't work for you. But I think don't see yourself as an entrepreneur and think, oh, I'm just a small entrepreneur, therefore I can't get to do all these big things. Already by copy, copy the essence of what you want to become. So that when you are showing up, also you are bringing into, into that what you see in the future, not necessarily what you are seeing now. Are you with me? So um, don't work at home if you, if you have an opportunity. You know, go ask for a friend of yours who's, who's got a, a place that you can share with. Work with other entrepreneurs. Are you with me? Find a nice space to work within so that when you're working with people and clients, you are, allow, you, you, you are aligning that. When you have a business meeting, you know, I, I know, don't meet at Starbucks. Uh, sorry, but for me, if you're going to be serious about it, you've got to just showcase it a bit more. So I think by copy, I mean copy the essence of the entrepreneur you want to see in the future, in how you look, how you show up, and how, you, how, and, 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 and how you're buttoned up. And I think those are the three things. Because when you are serious, we will take you seriously. Um, and I know that I've been to so many meetings where I knew that I was not fully prepared. Um, because when they asked me a question about the size of the market, I wasn't able to articulate that. And it's embarrassing as an entrepreneur if I don't know how, how much the size of the market that I'm involved in. So be buttoned up, guys, and just remember that how you see your business is how we're going to see it. And if you see it as a small little baby that is not going to go far, I suppose, it's going to be like that. But if you see it as a business that you believe is going to change our country, um, it's, it, that, that's how you want it to 
to, to show up. So positioning is not complicated. It's not all this marketing jargon. Um, it really is about how you show up and how you present your, yourself to the world. And that's very, very, very important. So for me, as a black-owned agency, I don't care whether I'm walking into a company with many big competitors who've been bigger than me, who've been doing it for, for longer. When I show up, I'm as big as them. And that's how I want to showcase myself to the world. And that's how we've been able to win. Awesome. Yeah. Thank you. Token. Thank you. Thank you for that. I think we do have a first question there at the <coughs> back. So you can introduce yourself and tell us uh, what is your question and to which speaker. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Nasha. And my first question is directed to all of the analytical data related um, uh, businesses on our panel. Um, I'm start a, a food related business but do the industry much differently from everyone else how can I as someone who's going to be enter, entering the food the food industry um, supposed to do my actual analysis of because whenever we do these analysis of saying um, my competition they are like this they're like this there's normally commonality between those two but because I'm basically going left with the whole thing, how am I supposed to? Um, how am I supposed to compare myself and actually correctly analyze my standing inside of the industry for when I finally get into it? Then my second question is to Ms. Tabelo Rao. That surname is going to chop. <laughs> <laughs> Just chop the last two letters. <laughs> They're not my surname. <laughs> um, <laughs> To, to Ms. Tabello, I would like to ask her, you, you mentioned how in your history you had opened a restaurant and you were talking about how finding raw, raw materials and things like that. Um, the aim of the business that I'm trying to get into is to have freshly, uh, freshly uh, harvested foods, so vegetables, fruits, etc., etc. Um, what was your approach to approaching farmers or or wholesale sellers for, for such resources and things like that. So, yeah, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for that, Nyasha. So, I think we can start with Talifani <coughs> to answer the first question from Nyasha, where he's asking about the analytics part of it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, thank you. Thank you so much. So, it's the, I'm assuming it's a restaurant. If I want to build a restaurant, I want to start first with the market research. My market research yeah. is focusing on first competitor analysis. What are other restaurants selling? How are they differentiating themselves? What is their selling point? And how do I differentiate myself? So based on the targeted restaurants that you think are similar to you, I would look at what are they positioning. All of these restaurants have their key points. You look at Nando's, the company. This and when you look at them, where do you want to come in as? And then now you want to go to price segmentation. How are they pricing their products and what's your penetration pricing? Um, and then also you want to understand the market that you are targeting. If you are going to create a, a restaurant of s selling certain food, and whatnot, what are you selling and to who? What type of market? Well, what I mean is there's some you could have been selling halal, you know. You can be selling to, to provide for certain things. So you have to understand that customer, what do they do? How often do they eat? How can you position yourself? Because now you don't have any restaurant. You're probably thinking mobile, you're thinking other different things. But the moment you understand that customer, you'll get an idea of how to position yourself. Mm. I think that's where analytics is important. Market research, understanding competitive analysis, pricing, and customer interest and preference then you position yourself different from other restaurants. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you for that, uh, Talifani. I would like us just to uh, get back to Nyasha and say, Nyasha, from Talifani's response, do you perhaps know what you're going to do when you leave here, or would you like to provide us with more information so that, you can, so that he can give you practical steps, so that when you leave, you know what will your spreadsheet look like, what will your book look like? Do you want to give us more information or was that sufficient, Nyasha? 
That was perfect. Awesome. Thank you, Telefani. Um, and then let's move on to Tavelo. You can. Thanks for the question. Yeah. I must say the food industry. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's, you, you must be there. You must be around as an owner. Um, first, to his point, know your customer, right? What sort of menu are you going to give them? What sort of ingredients do you need? Where can you source, source them locally? It's important because Sourcing means transport, it means um, uh, fuel, it means uh, times they open for you to access whatever you need to buy and how often, right? So understanding that will help you make it easier for you, right? With fresh foods, it's important to know that although you need to make a balance between buying bulk, you also need to understand that you can't you know, buy so much that you won't be able to, to use it up. Um, these, these inspections, you know, that come up, you know, you can't sell, you know, <laughs> used by dates that are expired food and all of those things. So it's a balance. I would say test your, test your menus first. Understand, okay, fine, this menu flies, this one not so much, and based on that, make decisions. Local suppliers, the best, because you negotiate price, you, you negotiate um, buying bulk, too, how often do you need to buy in a week? so that you are able to plan your trips, petrol, etc., and all those things. And um, uh, important, we love selling things we love, you know. <laughs> and it's a big problem. <laughs> Sell what your customer wants, you know. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's very important. So uh, for me, those are practical things that off the shelf you can just start looking into. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you for that, Tabelo. Um, oof, the gentleman in front has been <laughs> raising his hand. Can you get a mic uh, for the... Oh, is, 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 that's where we are. Okay, you can go ahead. Yeah, thanks for the opportunity. Um, my name is Kauhelo Svanda. I'm from Pretoria. I'm a um, young professional and aspiring um, entrepreneur. Uh, before I can even ask my question, I must say I'm, I'm a big fan for, for this guy, um, Mr. Banks, <laughs> Talifani and Pavel Lo. Um, I follow you guys a lot on LinkedIn and I love your work. Well done on, on your business. And allow me to say the famous uh, phrase, God is king. <laughs> um, my question is, um, okay, if you walk into your everyday retail store, um, the brands that you get to find, uh, like your Oppenheimer type of products, your famous brands, Tiger brands, you know, the same um, rainbow for chicken, when you're looking at chicken, yang, yam for peanut butter and all of that. Um, my question is just to the panel, anyone who's willing to take the question, what is being done to change the barriers to entry um, for new players in the retail platform, okay? And the second question is, I think this will be more applicable to Brand SA. Um, what is being done to help South Africans at large to be open to new entrants and new brands and, and to, to, to support them? Thank you. Thank you, thank you for that, Rao Hello. Um, Tony, do you mind taking both questions? You'll take the second one, okay. Awesome. Okay, so Sylvester will address the first one. Yes, you can go ahead, cool. Sylvester. The question about brands um, and access to market and why are we not seeing a lot of local brands um, you know, getting into sort of retail space is actually quite a, a big challenge that we are facing. Um, and I know that for me, it's a big passion because um, it's an area that I've been studying for many years. Um, every year, there's, there's a study that comes out by, the, you know, by Fortune 500 that talks to the best and most uh, biggest brands in the world. And, and in the history of all the best brands in the world, there's never been an African brand on the top 500, ever. J just let that sink in for a second. Which means Africans, South Africans, we are very good at producing products, we're not good at building brands. Okay. So as a result, it, it shows us that the opportunity, whether it's retail or fashion or 
property, whatever industry it is, the issue of local brands is a big problem. And I think in my assessment, there are a number of reasons, but the one key reason is really around our ability to be able to scale up those businesses. Because even at Tiger Brands, you can't find in China, you know, or in India, or in Brazil. Why is that? You know, and that's something that's quite fascinating for me. And it says our ability to look at our products or whatever we need to be able to put out in market must be done in such a way that the brand aspects of it are also amplified. Because other countries do a much better job of building brands than we do. Because we, as South Africans in particular, we're very happy wearing a Nike sneaker. And then, in fact, we, we work with Batu as well. So we work with Batu. We do all the brand work for Batu. And the opportunity for us to scale was to go against some of those big brands in order to say, actually, we are better and we can do much, much better as a brand that can be loved by South Africa, but not only South Africa, but also for, by, by the rest of the continent. So the issue of why there isn't much openness in retail is because um, a lot of the bigger global brands are much more stronger They've got bigger scale and muscle in those um, areas, and therefore they bamboozle everyone who's smaller trying to come up. So the opportunity is how do we create an area or a platform that allows for these brands to grow? Um, and that will mean investment into those businesses so they can be able to deliver at the scale that's required. Because the Tiger brands can deliver a much better scale than Sylvester Chauke Acha. Uh, because I can only give 10, you know, 10 boxes, but they can do 10 million in a minute. And that's where we fail. And that's really one of the biggest challenges. So in order for us, and I plead with all our entrepreneurs here, if you are in the zone of creating consumer-facing consumer products, think about those brands. And think the brands can't just be in South Africa alone. That you've got to think that they need to be uh, managed in such a way that they can be global. And that's very, very important. I hope that answers your question, Khao Khan. From a brand South Africa perspective, I just want to reflect the question back to you first. Um, so your, your question is around what is being done to expose South Africans to other South African brands, or rather to expose South Africans to other brands. I just want to make sure I captured it correctly. South African brands or other brands? So um, perhaps I need to create just a, 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 a clarity between brand South Africa and proudly South African. Mm. So proudly South African uh, is a sister organization, also a state entity um, like brand South Africa that is more focused on being able to give exposure to South African brands by putting their stamp, it's the South African flag in a tick. That's proudly South African. And we collaborate with Proudly South African on a lot of platforms in order um, to, to amplify the, 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 the exposure of South African brands. So from a brand South Africa perspective, we are showcasing that South Africa can. I, I don't know if I'm explaining it well enough. Um, so when we collaborate with Proudly South African, it's, it's to say, a lot of what comes out of South Africa is the ability, is the expertise, is the innovation. So it's not brand specific. Um, so when we do profile an entrepreneur, the, the hero of the message is South Africans can. But when proudly South African does it, it's here is a platform, sell Tony sneakers. So that's perhaps the difference. Um, and, and I think in terms of a brand South Africa supporting that platform, it's to support organizations that are intended, whose mandate is to do that. And when we do profile the work of entrepreneur services and their products, it's to show the cap capability and the assets, the existence of unique assets from South Africa to, to back up this great nation brand that is competitive, that is doing amazing. Awesome, awesome. Thank you, and thank you for that, Sylvester, as well as Tony. I am guessing the last question that we have is for our Swafilo. So, um, the mic guy, okay, here. is your question for our Swafilo because we only have capacity for our Swafilo's question before we move on? Okay, no problem. Awesome. Um, good evening uh, to the special panel up there and to the 
beautiful to be here. I am Taban Katide, a young entrepreneur, model, businessman, and currently top semi-finalist for Mrs. Mm -hmm. South Africa. As things yeah. stand. Yeah. <laughs> Beauty and brains and business, I love it. <laughs> All right, so I, my question is centered around um, innovation and being a disruptor. So essentially, um, back in Pretoria, what I do is I founded a scooter touring company where essentially what we do is facilitate and curate scooter ride experiences around Pretoria. So my business essentially has um, a foot in two industries, mainly being one, tourism, and late, at a later stage, transportation. So basically how that comes full circle is, one, we host the experience, so we take you on a scooter ride being you know, we can go to the Kasi, the, around the city, whatever the case may be. It can be your first experience as well. You have a great time with us and whatnot, but after that, you actually, um, through a partnership that I've set up, you can actually learn how to ride a bike yourself. So that basically now changes the conversation where, especially for students in particular, where instead of now saying, okay, let's, let's make a budget, 50K, 60K for a car, now that you've got the skill to ride, you can actually start leaning more into um, actually getting yourself a scooter, for example. Mm -hmm. So essentially, my, my question is, like I said, centered around innovation and disrupting. How do you create and actually expand and grow something that is actually not there currently, if that makes sense? Awesome. Thank you. Thank you for that, Tabang. And I think it speaks directly to what uh, uh, Osrefil is always working on, especially with Gen Next. So yeah. if you can do it. Absolutely. Um, to be honest, I think it's a lot easier to disrupt with something that's not there at the moment, right? Because, um, you know, there, it's not like you have a lot of uh, competitors in your space. Um, and I do think that when you, if that's what you're trying to accomplish, you need to make it very clear to the people that you want to use your product or service, in this case, your, your, your scooter service, um, what is unique and amazing about it. Do you know what I mean? So I think you've, you've spoken about a couple of really meaningful insights already. Um, so tourists who um, may not have ever wanted to see Pretoria, but now there's a very cool and interesting way to see this new part of the city. That's interesting. That's exciting. Be clear on how that is different and uh, uh, compelling because that's what tourists want. They want the unexpected. Um, I think when it comes to young people, and you're talking now about um, you know, using your scooters instead of using a bike, uh, I mean a, a car, um, we know that young people want experiences more than anything else. You know, in fact, if they could take that 50,000 they'd spend in a car and get 50,000 different unique experiences, they would trade that easily. Um, and I think that that's powerful, you know. So knowing that that's the insight you're going after, uh, make the most of it. Make that what you bring to the table is these kinds of unique experiences. Um, and so for me, that's exactly what it is. When you've got something that is already so disruptive, um, you have to work less hard because you just need to let people know about it. I think it's actually harder when you have something that is inherently not disruptive or unique, um, then you've got to find an angle that makes it unique. But I think you already have something that is uh, profoundly disruptive. And if you have um, the, the, the compelling way to tell that story, which is what Sylvester was talking about a bit earlier, you know, how do you tell that story in a way that is um, really, really innovative and, and interesting? Um, and find a way to tell it to different audiences to help you scale. Um, so, for example, I don't know if you do it already, um, but stuff like that, scooter rides and, uh, in, in interesting spaces, um, when you think about how they can translate to different audiences, you start to think about team building events. Um, corporates spend an insane amount of money on, on, on team building events, and it could be um, a, 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 a ready way for you to access a market that you weren't particularly in before, um, but one that has ready access to cash. Um, and one that is quite influential because those are the same parents you want to buy scooters for their children instead of buying uh, cars. Um, and so I think it's, a, it's about that. You've already got a disruptive, innovative idea. Think about who are the audiences that you can reach that you haven't thought about before. Um, and how do you tell your story in a way that demonstrates how disruptive and unique it already is? 
awesome. So Thank you. Are picture. you happy, yeah. Tabang? Okay, Tabang is giving us a thumbs up, so that's great. I see there are yeah. more people who are eager, but Hi. in the Zanale, This guy here, please, <laughs> even me. Even me. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay, my guy. Everyone wants to hear your question. So, um, the guy with the mic, can we... Oh, wow. Ah. Okay, okay. is to obviously also reach a market of people within the corporate who need to be to, to, to be motivated number one and also not just your normal motivation but for me my motivation uh, is more about on the resilient side how can you do it and push on if the odds are against you mm -hmm. in so many ways so how can i position myself how can i position my brand through that because i even said it myself like more like a business of company name I want to say that okay okay let me start a company name sto called storytellers touch but how do I then put it out there to the specific people because the people that I'm looking for is your universities and also your corporate uh, uh, side especially the youth because I'm all about youth unemployment so uh, just a, just a point of clarity is the case study your case study so did you write that it's your own experience that you've had over COVID. Okay, good. So I always ask, who's gonna pay for it? That's always the first question for me is, I see this is awesome, who's gonna pay for this? Um, and I must say that in the last two years, we've seen a lot of, com of conversations around resilience, uh, how do companies get better? So that conversation is, is actually, is, has been happening. And I think what could be interesting in your case is um, your take on it and who do you think is gonna benefit from? Um, and I think that there are two areas which I see as good opportunities. Um, the main question, like I said, who's going to pay for it? Because if you've already been doing it at the universities, are the universities paying you to speak there? Or is it just for free? If it is not being paid for, I think the opportunities you have is to go for more of the corporate events, um, team building, um, more smaller businesses that you are able to then go in and offer that service to them. Um, example, an agency like ours has a lot of, uh, you know, an engagements with many different brands. Seeing that could be able to spark an opportunity for someone else to then come in and listen. And I hope it's hot. I hope it's a hot case study because at the end of the day, it really is about that. Um, and once it's there, it will catch on, um, you know, honestly. Do we have it on YouTube already? Okay. Yeah. Mm. <laughs> okay, good. <laughs> I think you're definitely um, on the right track. And uh, I think maybe, uh, like I said, if, if you look at who then is going to be able to pay for it and identify some of those opportunities, and we can share later about maybe some opportunities I have. But I think important is who do you think is going to be the one to fund it? Um, and who will it benefit to? And I think it's difficult for me to understand it if I haven't really gone through the content. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
So perhaps to add uh, to what Sylvester has said, I'm going to pick up on the, on the YouTube. One of the things that have happened um, in the recent past is that people are also now recognizing the need to establish their own platform. So it's great that you have exposure and you have been interviewed before, which is nice because you know, you, you're going to get some searchability yeah. um, based on that. But I, I, I think also to be able to give people a taste of your stuff, you need to create your own platform and say, um, th this is what I do to people um, alongside getting the, the, the gigs from corporate and, uh, and you know, other um, opportunities. What I do like is that your, your, your story is about resilience. So they, there is nothing that resonates with people um, to motivate them beyond a real story. It's yours and it's about resilience. And I think one of the things, uh, some of the work that we do in Brand South Africa is, is domestic perceptions research and understanding the South African. And uh, one of the best characteristics that uh, probably came out of a bad situation in our history is how resilient we are as a nation. So that is something that is close to the hearts of many South Africans. And one, but two, in the recent past, there is such a, uh, there is such a need simply because of where people are at, the discouragement, the challenges emanating from losing jobs, losing opportunities, not getting them. There's much more patience needed. There's much more drive for people to, so people need to actually be motivated now probably more than we used to be. We, we need people to keep on keeping on and finding the light at the end. So I think that's a good thing. You know, so you, you have a market, you, you're proven in that somebody has paid for it before, yeah, yeah. establish your platform. And you know, I think one of the most attractive things about you, if I was to be in a position to say, let's get this guy, you believe in your own stuff. Yeah. That is attractive. Yeah. So you're already on the right track, my brother. <laughs> well, look, you're doing what we like. You, you, you're making do with your own story. You're willing to tell it, and you want to collaborate. So let's talk. Awesome. <laughs> awesome. I really, really like that. And, um, yeah, I like what Sylvester said as well when he said, uh, let's chat afterwards. So I think some of my speakers will still be available after this so that you guys can ask questions. And if we didn't give you the opportunity, maybe you can introduce yourself as well. So now we are heading to the final round where we are just going to wrap it up. And I'm going to ask for the closing remarks from my speakers. It's been a lovely discussion. I learned a lot. And remember, when we started, we spoke about the fact that Africa is a young continent, right? And we spoke about the, the fact that there are opportunities. There's a lot to look forward to, right? So taking into account the fact that that is how we started, and taking into account the fact that our topic for today is how to position yourself or your business for success, both locally as well as internationally. Four closing remarks from my panelists. I just want to find out from you guys, what do you think when you think about the African youth and the next decade, what are you most excited about? And maybe what would you like to leave them with so that within the next decade, they are more successful. They've taken the opportunities both locally as well as um, in a global scale. So from your side, what are you most excited about? And what can you give our audience so that they are more prepared for the next uh, 10 years, so to say? Yeah. I think one of the things that are most important is that we believe in ourselves. Mm -hmm. We can, as I said in the beginning, there's a lot of work that does go into, that can go into packaging this. There are a lot of unique features in sectors in different spaces in our country um, where amongst other entities, Brand South Africa packages and puts this country's best foot forward um, as a competitive destination for trade and investment. Mm -hmm. I, 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 I think we have an advantage in that, unlike other nations that ha are seen as perhaps a little bit more successful than others, we, are, we have not been afraid to own our challenges and speak about them so that um, it, it doesn't like, sound like we are selling frills and rubbish, quite frankly. We, we are able, we are open, we are transparent. 
we are able to express ourselves and our unhappiness, I think what we need to then also do in the balance is to own what it is we can hold on to that is good mm -hmm. and, and, and actually own that space and start talking about that a little bit more because I think there's nothing more off-putting than to have an attracted somebody come here to um, a diverse, vibrant, full of potential, full of innovation nation, um, it, it full of innovation kind of um, nation that is unable to say anything positive about itself mm -hmm. though. So I think we need to actually buy our own stuff. We need to buy the belief in ourselves. Mm -hmm. If we look at just some of the little bit of um, opportunity that we had to hear some of the innovations here, mm -hmm. um, you wouldn't really tell some mornings when you look at the news that there's so much good happening. There is so much good. Let us believe in ourselves. We have uh, one of the campaigns that we run is hashtag I believe in SA. Mm -hmm. Find your reason. It could just be you because at the face of the world, brands of African entities can do all the work. The biggest, truest, and most authentic expression of how real it is that we are selling is the interaction with you. Mm -hmm. So just remember, I'm gonna leave it at this. Mm -hmm. In a moment of interaction with anything or anyone not from here, you are South Africa to the world. Mm -hmm. we, we all stand on your shoulders at that time. What are you putting out there? What are you, are you representing what you would like to see? And the good thing is the future does belong to us because we are a young nation. So 10 years from now, we will have no excuses if we actually detracted from ourselves now. So let's not. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you, Tony. Um, analytics advertising is a data technology company that is hiring professionals from engineering material science, mathematicians. We represent young professionals, African innovators, pathfinders. What I'm excited about is to find all of you young innovators joining the platform and helping large corporations automate them, digitize them, and bring new technologies that will help them grow their businesses. We are currently in, uh, we've opened a new branch in Botswana. We are opening another one in Zim. We've got a team in Zambia and in Kenya. But we've got a residency in Estonia, Europe, and Middle East. We are excited about the future and we are deliberate. What we want to create is a platform of young innovators to go there and make their names proud. But as I do this, I want to talk for you. I want to remind you to love yourself. Because if you know who you are, you will know who you are not. You know what I mean? Awesome. Thank you. Thank you, Tadizani. Yes, Ms. Um, I think what I'm most excited about um, and is the reality that, you know, 80% of Africans, um, and that includes this country too, and for those of you who are under some strange illusions, 80% um, of Africans are employed in the, in the informal economy. And for many people, that's terrifying. It's like, oh my goodness, unemployment is such a problem. What are we going to do? What a crisis. I've got to admit, that excites the hell out of me because it means um, that that is where the solutions are going to come from. Um, it's not going to be corporate. It's not going to be, I don't know, the UN or government. It's not going to be any of those institutions that are going to drive the future of this continent as the people in this room. Um, and I, that really, really excites me. Um, and I think the biggest lever we have is just awareness of all the different ways in which people and entities want to support you. Um, I was at a dinner the other evening and someone from the IDC was lamenting bitterly that uh, Minister Patel has told them they must disperse 23 billion in, um, in support before the end of the year. And she was just thinking, oh my goodness, how am I going to do that? Who am I going to give it to? Where do these people come from? And it's just kind of like, I wish people knew that. I wish, I wish people knew that the IDC is stressed about having to disperse 23 billion rand worth of business funding. Nedbank has 200 million rand worth of new business funding that they are equally stressed about who am I going to give this money to? And I just think that there's this massive gap between the people with the solutions who are the people in this room um, and the people who need the problem solved and have the money to do so. Um, and when I think that is what excites me because that's a solvable problem. 
Do you know what I mean? To connect those two things is completely solvable. And I'm, I'm hugely excited for when those two things come together because I think the solutions will be extraordinary. Ah, oh, Rafila, you are talking my language. <laughs> Me and you after this, <laughs> we will know how to deploy the money. <laughs> We've got a lot of <laughs> entrepreneurs in the country that need the support. Mine is simple, guys. Um, it's okay not to know, but it's not an excuse. We've got to learn and learn and sponge up, you know. And work ethic for me is very important. I don't know, hey, like, guys, the felt world is not sleeping because they are producing products. They are, we need to create a culture amongst ourselves, you know, to have a great work ethic. He could have given an excuse to say, I guess I'm tired. I've been in a flight for over 20 hours, but he's here. That's work ethic. It's as simple as that. Work ethic is important. An entrepreneur never really sleeps, if I must be honest. We do t 10, 15 things. You may be shocked. Why are you doing so many businesses? There's so many unemployed people in this country. I've got to help solve those problems, right? And that's your job as an entrepreneur. So work ethic is important. My dough really is a solution at the palm of your hand, scaling it to, you know, our national space, international, and purely for simple reasons. No one cares about the entrepreneur. We all want numbers and sales. No one cares about the mental health. No one cares about the insurance. Are they insured if they hit, you know, the employees? So those are the solutions that we are thinking of and that we're deploying to say, 360, how is an entrepreneur looking like and how do we support them to perform at their op most optimum, you know? So we find different solutions and some of them is what I was talking about, your sales, your community, business support, but we do much more, you know? We think about your health, mental health, who are the partners we should partner with to make your life easy, you know? Um, um, Estate planning, you know, um, uh, family business, be beyond you when you pass away, what happens to your business? So those are the solutions as my dough that we bring to you as an entrepreneur because we think you're important. Thank you, thank you. And I think as um, the last one to speak about, um, entrepreneurship is, is really tough. And quite often, um, even 10 years in, you look back and you think, oh my God, do I have to go through this still? Mm. Um, and I regret sometimes that I didn't take that big uh, CMO role somewhere. <laughs> but I think with all that said, you know what's happening outside of this auditorium currently. There are lots of problems that ch the country's facing um, and a lot of opportunities, uh, to your point, um, the, the solution is going to come from people like us mm -hmm. in this room who are going to make a difference. So as we build our own businesses, my, my plea and what I'm excited about is the opportunity to collaborate with other people to be able to help you be better. Because sometimes when you are sitting on your own, you think you are the it. Um, but actually, you need someone to challenge you. So I'm excited about what I'm seeing in my space in the area of the work that I'm working with um, Batu and Theo on, um, that in five years you can have 300 people work for you isn't that amazing? Mm -hmm. Have a brand that you can do that in five years. That's amazing. Um, that we have a business that on a monthly basis, we spend about six million rands back into small owned and small businesses, small black owned businesses that we fund and that, and that we use um, their services. It's possible. So let's, let's not make it a thing of it's out there far away for, for the lucky few. It's not there for the lucky few. I think it's there for us all to make an opportunity out of where we are. And I think it's, it's, it's also about what's, what we have as an opportunity around each other to be able to build something more powerful. Um, because I know there's a lot of individual strengths, but I think if we, if we combined our efforts, we, we, we can really be the solution that we want to see in our country. Because you, you know we need it. You know we need it. Awesome. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Wow, what a session. My panelists, I even want to say I'm going to miss you. <laughs> because we are all aligned in terms of empowering our young entrepreneurs. So remember, when we started, my promise for you was that I want you to leave with practical tools so that when you leave here, you know what to do. So when we started, we did introduce our topic. 
how can you position your business for success both locally as well as internationally? And just to wrap it up, I'm just going to um, wrap up some of the key highlights when it comes to some of the practical things that you can take away from this discussion and you can start doing them, right? So starting with Tony here, just remember that you can go straight ahead to Brand SA on all social media platforms, on all their websites, click so that you can be profiled and then you can have all the ads. You can be on CNN so that you can be seen by different countries so that we can see what you've been doing. From what Talifani was saying, data is everything. You have to know your numbers. You have to know who are your competitors. What do your customers want? So pay attention to those numbers so that you can move on to the next step. And then when it comes to Osra Filoy, she's been talking about strategic positioning as well as innovation. And she has said it as well. Through their reports, they've realized that, you know, it's, it's, it's actually um, the young people are looking at things such as accessibility, experience, uh, individuality, and all of those things. Take that all and, and think about how am I positioning myself so that I align with what other young people want, with what the market wants as well. And then, when it comes to what Tavelo has said as well, remember, it's okay not to know, but yes, it's not an excuse. So seek out incubators such as my dough and the others so that you can get that piece of the pie of the sales that are going around. And also seek the knowledge with regards to what is ESD and how can it help me as well. And last but not least, when it comes to Sylvester, he's been talking about amplifying your brand, but also realizing that it's not going to happen in the next 10 days, right? So taking into account the fact that you might have to start by working for other people. Yes, on Instagram, people might be talking about, I don't want to have a boss, I don't want a 9 to 5, but then realize that that might help you because gaining that experience through internship, through trying out different things with different employers will actually give you the skills that even today you can see he has and he can run a sustainable business. So from my side, I think we achieved what we tried to achieve today. And I am so happy. And thank you for our amazing poetry session. So from my side, uh, thank you, thank you, thank you. Enjoy the rest of your evening and go conquer. But then I'm going to hand over to, uh, I think, Tato and Kawekazi to do the last closing remarks. And me and my panel are going to head out. And hopefully, you can get a chance to chat to them as well. Bye, guys. <laughs> Hello. Uh, can we give our panel just a round of applause once more? Um, I mean, just uh, first of all, before uh, most of the things, I think uh, there's a special you know, group of people that I want us to give a round of applause to. Uh, that is the Young African Entrepreneurs Institute team, led by <coughs> our executive director for operations, Osis Q and uh, our executive head uh, for marketing, Usis Tato, and uh, the executive director for uh, research, who is actually leading the, the, the hackathon that is taking place, and the collective. Can we give them a round of applause for this kind of a great platform, you know? Um, ladies and gentlemen, I would like to say thank you to the program director for today, um, who led us very well, uh, leading to the panel. I would like to say thank you to our panel. Uh, Cizanel, you led us very well. You are shy in Toyako, you know. Um, so thank you, uh, my brother, uh, uh, Mashak uh, Sylvester. It's actually interesting that he literally just got into the country and came here just to be for you guys. Can we give him a round of applause? Um, Vasa, uh, Bo Banks, uh, thank you very much uh, for honoring the invitation. We really appreciate your presence and contribution to the conversation. Uh, Usis Tony, 
thank you very much for coming through, you know, and representing Brand South Africa and just like making clarity in terms of some of the things and the opportunities that are available actually for young people that are here today. Uh, Makadze, uh, thank you very much for coming through. And Siswamina, Sisarifilwe, Naken Sashnen. Without wasting any time, we have just come to the end of our program. Um, the last person that I want to acknowledge and extend gratitude towards is the MEC Mamnomantu for staying here with us throughout and for actually giving a keynote address that speaks to the young people of our country, particularly now here in Gauteng, to say, how do they get to benefit from the Gauteng government in terms of support, you know, uh, from procurement? And actually, they, this is something that they are raising, they've been raising throughout the week to say, uh, in actual fact, you know, to get a, a project from government, you need to know someone and all those kind of things. And I think we just need to move away from that and take young people into confidence that it is not about who you know, but it is about the quality and the work that you have to offer for the government or even just for the department specifically. So thank you very much, uh, Mama, for gracing our occasion and actually giving that keynote. Let's give her an, a hand of applause. Uh, by the way, they call her Imama in the streets there. So yeah, <laughs> she's, she's well known by uh, the, 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 the word uh, or the name Imama. Um, finally, to our partners, I'd like to say thank you to NetBank uh, for being with us here, for partnering with us. I'd like to say thank you uh, to the Industrial Development Corporation. I'd like to say thank you to IX Engineers. And I'd like to also extend gratitude uh, towards um, GreatStar. And also, I would like to extend gratitude as well um, to the hosting institution, which is the University of Witwatersrand. Let's just give them a hand of applause because they've made this to be possible. It speaks actually mostly to what Utabelo was speaking about to say, um, there are people who are going to be paying on your behalf. We want to make these platforms as free as we can, but all you need to do is to make yourselves available and benefit from them. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much, um, and I would like to wish you well for the rest of the evening as we engage and network. And from my side and the team, would like to say all the best with your businesses. We are looking forward to seeing you tomorrow. Our master classes are starting at 9. Just come and benefit as much as you can, and let's keep it going, and let's keep it flowing, just like the water. Thank you. <laughs>
tackling. Young people must rise up and bring their dreams to life.